expected deliverables of carbon farming include carbon removal from the atmosphere and subsequent storage in the crustal ecosystem, avoidance of future CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions, and the reduction of existing CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So these are all very important to sustainable management. Farmers should be paid by public funding, uh, by private funding, by industry, uh, transfer of funds from the supply chain of agricultural products. There are several options, including the carbon markets. Carbon market is not yet very well developed, especially in the developing countries. But demand for carbon offset uh, it also needs to be developed. Companies which have taken carbon neutrality pledges, and there are many companies which have done that, Uber, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Sony, many others, uh, IBM, uh, they can provide income and get carbon credit uh, taken from farmers and ranchers and foresters. And these pledges, few voluntary and companies have a wide latitude. Uh, buyers are, however, uncertain and the current price of 10 to $20 per credit is not high enough to motivate farmers to take risks. Private sector, nevertheless, can play a very significant role, and we must work with the private sector by promoting nature-positive agriculture. They can increase access to input to farmers, small landholders. They can improve investment in agriculture research and they can help in promoting education at all level. Fertilizer and other management are very important, but water is a critical factor. Fertilizer efficiency cannot be improved unless water retention capacity of the green water in the root zone can be improved. And this part of linking fertilizer with water is very critical. If you focus on carbon, the need and efficiency both the efficiency can be improved and the need can be decreased by improving carbon storage in the soil. How much should the farmer be paid? In my opinion, they should receive $130 per ton. That's about $30 to $35 per credit. Right now, private companies, some of them are doing a very good job and I salute them, but please do not underpay farmers. That will lose their cooperation, that will lose their confidence, that will lose their trust. Pay them properly, fairly, justly, transparently. I want to repeat, pay farmer properly, adequately, fairly, justly, transparently. That is the best win-win option for all. Soils also have rights. Why rights? Because soils are living entity. 25% of all biodiversity of the world is in the top soil. Therefore, just as the rights of human, rights of animal, there must also be rights of soil and rights of nature and rights of rivers and rights of oasis and rights of mountains and rights of wildlife. Being the essence of all life, soil must have rights to be protected, restored, thrive, and managed judiciously. I hope COP27 will put this statement Soils have a right to be protected, restored, thrived, and managed judiciously in the report. Soil and life have evolved together. There is no life without soil and no soil without life. They go together. And that statement should come out loud and clear. Soil carbon is also important to achieving sustainable development goals. Many of them Primary goal and hunger. You can never end hunger and hidden hunger, both without soil health and soil carbon. Climate action, very important. Uh, obviously, the life on land, land degradation, neutrality. The concept is very good. I actually prepared a report for it in Rio 20, Rio plus 20 meeting. Uh, but achieving that requires political willpower. Ending poverty, good health clean water, renewable energy, they all depend on soil carbon and soil health. Population of hydrogen cities is increasing tremendously. By 2100, Dar es Salaam will have 74 million people. Delhi, 57 million people. Khartoum, 57 million. Niamey, 56. Kabul, 50. Karachi, 
49, the long way 41, Cairo, 41 million people. Every 10 million people require 6,000 tons of food per day. City planners must think about food availability within the city. And that's a very important part because total number of city, which will be more than 10 million population by 2100 will be 83. City planning does not, is not complete unless the food security, how to feed these mega cities must be part of the city planning process. And that's a very important part. Education of the next generation is very important. In addition to three R's, the goal of the education is to prepare the next generation to address global issues, food and nutrition, environment, soil, water, air, global warming, personal responsibility. Each one of us is a culprit and victim, both. And we must rectify this situation by teaching younger generation the ethics, integrity, and responsibility, respect for nature. That should be part of education. Therefore, connecting children, even at primary school level, kindergarten level, with nature, so that they know where the essential services come from, is very critical. Teaching them the importance of nature right at young age. I would strongly recommend that SCOP 27 consider translating science into action. Creating science is not good enough unless it's translated into action to address issues. Science of dryland farming into action, how can we translate it? By linking with sustainable development goal and scaling up to regional and global level by networking, cooperation, and building bridges across disciplines and political social boundaries. That's the important message that must come out. Soil and agriculture must come out as a solution to global issues. I began by saying these were not emphasized in COP26. That must not happen. That is not acceptable. Being the source of critical ecosystem services for human well-being and nature, it is essential to make judicious management of soil integral to addressing any global issue. We must go beyond producing food and fuel. It is very critical to objectively consider how we produce, store, process, transport, and consume our food. And this is the food system. Food system begins with production agriculture, but the entire chain, and manage these byproducts of agricultural system in ways that spare the land for nature. It's in the interest of the humanity to protect the planet, to protect the dry land, to protect the ecosystem. Therefore, we must return some land back to nature, some water back to nature by maximizing the use efficiency of input and minimizing the environmental footprint. Lastly, COP27, and I want to say it very loud and clear so there is no misunderstanding. It must clearly state the importance of making sustainable agriculture and sustainable soil health management as win-win solution to climate change and other environmental issues, and also being critical to advancing sustainable development goals of the United Nations. There is no mistake. There is no misunderstanding. There is no reason why to skip that. And with that, I think I have saved about seven minutes and I'll be glad to any, answer any question. And if you have no question, I'll be glad to move forward and invite our first speaker. Yeah, the floor is open for questions. Dr. Smile. Yeah, so with all the wisdom you have mentioned, Prof Professor Mel, um, there's no questions now from the audience. You can come okay. later. And then uh, if you can proceed, I think uh, there is about Thank you. 30 minutes. Thanks so much. Please. Okay, please. so moving forward then, we have six speakers and we have 90 minutes. 
I would suggest every speaker takes 12 minutes and leave three minutes for question. At the most, you can have 15 minutes. We are beginning now, and uh, we will have a presentation from Dr. Rolando Flores Pelarza, the Dean and Chief Administrative Officer in the College of Agricultural, Consumer, and Environmental Sciences at New Mexico State University, Las Cruces. The floor is yours, sir. 12 minutes, no more than 15. Thank you very much. This is a, a great opportunity, and I appreciate it. Let me try, try to stay in, in time with, uh, with, with the presentation. First of all, I, I really <laughs> am humbled by all the, all the presenters and all the uh, high level of information that has been uh, brought, brought here in. From what, I, what I'm going to present is from the point of view of a land grant university in a dry land like it is the New Mexico State University. What is what we are doing and how are we trying to, to move away in, in all of this? So I'm going to do very briefly on this, on this slide to try to save some, some time. First of all, what is the mission of our college? And this is part of the uh, impacting the environment in sciences, because we see our role as an engine for economic and community development in New Mexico. But how does this moves into a larger sphere is what we want to say. NMSU is, a, as I mentioned, on a land grant Hispanic serving institution uh, committed to work globally to create international partnerships for better future. Uh, in NMSU, we're strengthening our international insertion of ACES, particularly in some of the characteristics of our dry land area and working with the Latin American region as a part of our uh, historical, uh, uh, part of our history and part of where we are located in the area than semi-arid land. The main objective of, of NMSU as a University is to working with the grand challenges of our time and motivating a specific group. We, we found, we <clears throat> have our activities and the four principal pillars, which are food and fiber production and marketing, water use and conservation, family development, and health of New Mexicans and environmental stewardship. So as you can see, we're intrinsically li uh, linked to these uh, uh, purposes of, of, the, of the meeting that we are looking. Uh, one of the major important things is, as, a, as I mentioned from a cultural and a historical point of view, how we integrated in the Latin American region. Uh, we are located in the Southwest of the US and, uh, and an area and semi-arid area. And we have been building a strategic alliances with different uh, forces or groups of producers and farmers and ranchers, and we just created the strategic alliance with Chihuahua and Desert, which is basically the farmers and ranchers that we are connected in the southern part of the United States, in New Mexico, and the northern part of, of the Chihuahua, the state of Chihuahua in Mexico. We also has, have been banking on our strength and the relationship with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture. And this cooperation is based around the major uh, formulated around some of the needs of the Latin America region and how we can, as a land grant university in the southern part of the United States, will work together to try to solve these grand problems that we have. As you can, very familiar with all this information and I, uh, the, the, that we, it has been presented by the previous uh, uh, speakers. This is where we are located. <coughs> and our action is basically working directly with the AICA in the, in, in the Institute. One of the things that we try to do is how do we make our system more efficient and how can we work and apply some of the technologies that we can use to improve the situation that we have in, in, in the eco-region eco characteristics of New Mexico. 
we are no strange to some of the major problems that have been associated with climate change. And the last, this year alone, we have had the higher, the largest and biggest fire in New Mexico. Uh, <clears throat> and this has been uh, experimenting abnormally dry conditions for over the last 12 years. 27% of, of New Mexico currently is, is a, in under a, a moderate drought. Drought. 47% of the of New Mexico area is experiencing severe drought, and 14% of New Mexico is experiencing extreme drought. 0.3% of uh, New Mexico is experiencing exceptional drought. So as you as you can see, we are experiencing all of these problems that have been mentioned mentioned before, and we are working on on, on this how to go. So what is the strategic role of science and technology? And uh, in, in order to, to provide a dynamic assessment of impact in climate change and ecosystem. And some of the, the basic things that we are trying to do is modeling not only vegetation, carbon cycle, <coughs> dry land water, and energy exchange, and understand the land surface atmosphere interactions at the local regional scales of the southwestern of the United States dry land. So the first thing that we are doing is a characterization of climatological and ecological production systems and data collection. This model is based on scientific and technological information to contribute to policymakers to formulate policies. Uh, <coughs> uh, one of the, the major things that we are looking is the kind of holistic approach to a multidisciplinary team. As a Hispanic serving institution and a, a minority serving institution, we don't have or we don't count with the large uh, funding that we have or, or the, the large depth of knowledge in many cases. So this, we have been solving it by creating teams of scientists that are tackling bigger problems. <clears throat> we are moving in the last, last year we went from 64 meteorological stations to 90, and we expect to have close to 215 for next year uh, uh, stations. This is extremely important because not only affects, not only we get the data, but we also have an impact on the economics for the insurance application. We also have the Hornera experimental range, which is over 100 years old of continuous data collection in semi-arid lands. The grazing behavior of pastures and animal records and water management under critical conditions. The most limiting factor that we consider in, in, in agriculture, it, it was mentioned previous speakers, there was about 80% of the water is using agri agriculture. In New Mexico, it's around 85 to 88%. So it creates a very um, challenge to, to work with uh, um, urban areas and air management in pre the Spanish presence in, in, in New Mexico by the natives uh, in the area. So we are trying to cope with all these, all these issues and uh, our produ uh, new sources and some of those is developing alternative sources of water like with uh, processing or, or yeah, yeah. produce water. Uh, new alternative crops, obviously, is in the major, one of the major things that we are trying to, to do. And uh, also the role of economy and public policy and hydrologic characteristics as a contribution to explaining access to safe drinking water are being looked at. So we are in the middle of the biggest problem that we have and we have to, to try to solve by bringing different technologies from different areas. In this case, we're trying to use robotics in production and some other uh, mechanisms. Along with this, all this, we need to, we are working in carbon management. And uh, one of the major things that we are trying to, uh, uh, to work is in developing um, data analysis for the different carbon uh, the alternative 
detail that can be managed or can be developed and would cost efficient in, different, in four different areas. So we're looking at the carbon management in drainage areas and urban areas, forest areas, and in farming. Uh, I, let me mention that 28% that New Mexico is the fifth largest state in the union, but uh, the, the, pro, the, the, the forest area is 28%. So in this par part of all these, this comprehensive study that we are working with our, our scientists and our work, work it is, is the connectivity between the forest, the rangeland, cropland, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the urban area. Uh, inc inclusively, in, as a part of our priorities is digital agriculture, but digital, digital agriculture not only looking into the management of, of uh, introduction of more heavily mechanization in some areas due to the, to the reduction of uh, the availability of labor, but also in terms of data collection and management and, and analysis. Uh, needless to say, also in terms of developing genetic resources, the generic resources for these agroecologists, as it was mentioned by Dr. Lala, is extremely important, and we need to start working. We are working on this very heavily. We are working with different, uh, uh, for example, in the area of forest, we, are, uh, we just had very close call, not uh, early this year, when a uh, forest fire almost burned our science center, and we had to move very quickly to save the seed bank and to move the seed bank far, uh, farther from the fire, uh, and especially because those that seed bank is where we have all the drought uh, pre, uh, area, uh, the resistant varieties to trees. Along with all of these, the combination of renewable energy, and this is an example of a couple of uh, science uh, areas, science stations that we have centers that where we conduct research and where we are, are implementing solar panels at a large scale in collaboration with electric power uh, companies as well in wind production. And one of our ranches we have located about 39 windmills that export the energy to the city of Los Angeles. And obviously uh, uh, there is a in New Mexico depends strongly on the oil, and so we're looking at creating a, a sustainable management. Nothing we can do if we cannot maintain a bioeconomy, and a bioeconomy in which we actually are able to develop uh, not only the subsistence, we cannot think about uh, the big, we, we keep talking uh, and listening about the, the big migrations how this is going to be affecting and is affecting in many countries. But at the same time, we have to create conditions for those farmers and those producers in, in those areas for adapting climate variability. Uh, we have been, uh, I don't want to extend too much on this, but one of our major areas that we are conducting uh, development trials is the introduction, reintroduction of the criollo cattle in, 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 a, in our area. And this Criollo cattle comes from the Taramara areas in, uh, in Northern Mexico and uh, make it a more efficient and sustainable. So That's in summary, I don't left. understand any more. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm at a point of, of concluding this. And I just wanna say that even though, uh, because of all these, these from, uh, big issues that in worldwide we are working. Uh, our approach at New Mexico State University, we consider ourselves a part of the global uh, 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 impact and working with the AICA in Latin America, but also we see our future in these six areas, uh, the, this uh, area we're working in. Carbon management, obviously, genetic resources, the bioeconomy, renewable energy, water management, and digital agriculture. So this is, a, I hope I have conveyed a very uh, succinct and very modest approach that we are having in New Mexico State University 
to try to contribute to the solution of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Galarza. I think in the interest of time, we are clearly going to continue and uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end of the session. Therefore, uh, I want to move on to the next uh, speaker, Dr. ML Jha, whose title of presentation is Sustainable Intensification and Enhanced Resilience of Drylands, Constraints and Strategies. Dr. Jha is Principal Scientist at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, CIMIT, based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Uh, Dr. Jha. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Uh, uh, I just moved to increase that. You just uh, moved to increase that. Yes. <laughs> the TV was all my. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, in next 12 minutes or 30 minutes, uh, I'll share what are the constraints and what could be the strategies in terms of sustainable intensification and enhanced resilience of the dry land. Uh, at the cost of repetition, I'll again repeat what are the challenges uh, on the smallholder systems in the dry land. And when we talk about the dry lands, uh, it's a global uh, hotspot for uh, contemporary as well as uh, the future climatic variability where our natural resources are really highly stressed. Uh, but at the same time, we, we need more nutritious food from less of the inputs and also the rapidly degrading or depleting natural resources having uh, you know higher uh, variability in terms of the climate. Also, when we see the smallholder system, the global map, the, all the red areas, you know, so the very smallholder farmers. So the dominance of the smallholder farmers are in the dry lands. And those farmers are providing 75% of the food what we consume in the Asia and Africa. That means the smallholder farmers are very critical for us. Also, when we See the relationship of the smallholder farmer, the dominance of the dry lands as well as the malnourishment. They are closely aligned. So wherever you see the smallholder farmer, they are malnourished and also uh, the, the water limited uh, scenario. Uh, the climate change already have caused serious uh, threats to us over past uh, uh, 50, 60 years. We have lost almost 21% of the total sector productivity because of the climate change, and that through the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and, uh, and 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 it's it's more in in case of the dry land, especially in the Africa. Uh, at the same time, you know there are significant environmental footprints of our food system, and the food systems are contributing 18 gigatons of the carbon dioxide equivalent, which is 34% of the total global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emission. And I think of the 18 gigatons, 71% comes from, from the agriculture and the land use changes and the rest are coming from the value chain. That means the production uh, of, of uh, the system or the food production is something very important that we have to address uh, the issues. Uh, other issues which were highlighted by Professor Lal and others, the water salinization and also biodiversity, I think with the climate change, which is more the extinction of a lot of the species, uh, the recent crisis and the food, energy, uh, and, and, and the fertilizer. And of course, a lot of emerging pests and diseases because of the, the climate change. Uh, the dry lands are very critical for achieving the sustainable development goals because the dry lands, uh, you know, are hosting almost uh, 3 billion people uh, and half of the livestock of, 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 of the world. And uh, the people, you know, there are a lot of people living under the chronic, uh, you know, poverty. We have left only with the annual, eight annual harvest to achieve our sustainable development goals. That means we need to move faster, not only to stop regenerating our natural resources, but also to regenerating our natural resources for our secure future. And I think sustainable intensification can help us in regenerating our natural resources. So when we talk about the sustainable intensification strategy for, for systemic transformation of the dry lands, I would say the quality science has to grow. The quality science is important. Science for the food system transformation to our sustainable development goals. We need to have the strategic and complementing partnership. That means the collective action, working together. We need greater investment, more people, not only the government, but also the philanthropy, foundation or the civil society need to put more money uh, for sustainable intensification of the dry land. 
we need to have the production to consumption continuum that means the one health uh, focus that's what we need to put together and i think how we deliver that science to the society we need to have science of scaling linking our research output with the local national regional or the global priorities with appropriate business model uh, but there are challenges in terms of uh, scaling this uh, the sustainable intensification because most of our agriculture research and development has been component focused with often limited scaling and the potential for impact at a scale and that amplifies the trade offs between the livelihood objectives and the sustainable intensification actors because we got a system farmer got a system that consists of the genetic the socio economic the ecological uh, the elements so that means we need to understand uh, the farm profitability versus the ecosystem services where we convert so the trade offs uh, in 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 that respect are something very very important so i would propose 10 point agenda for sustainable intensification of the dry land the first one is one size doesn't fit all because we can have a common set of the principles that we can identify but there's a whole lot of diversity of the farm to the farming system to agroecology we need tailor made solutions for the sustainable intensification integrating genetics ecological and socio economic innovation and the information considering the whole farm and the household issues rather than commodity centric approach and and we can have you know the designing tools uh, for sustainable farming system uh, the second one is we need to map the crop types and prioritize the cropping systems and farming systems to deploy the sustainable intensification and uh, you know the sustainable intensification is important uh, for for addressing some of the issues like fertilizer the legume can address some of those issues the grain legume can contribute 35 teragrams of the nitrogen annually pro biological nitrogen fixation there has been a significant advancement uh, in terms of the geospatial technologies which can help us in a spatial and temporal mapping of the crop types and cropping system for designing our sustainable intensification approaches now we need to have this targeted bundle system solution uh, and and those solutions for congruence between the three pillars of the sustainability the people the planet the profit and i think the science evidence based consensus with the context and farming system specific adapted bundled sustainable intensification practices with well defined recommendation domains are required for accelerated adoption of sustainable intensification practices and for which we need to have the whole farm uh, you know approach a systems approach for designing those things we also need to have a phase build on approach because neither we have the full package of the sustainable intensification ready no those can be developed overnight but that doesn't mean that we should hold or we should wait for long so we can have a phase approach you know that that can help us immediately taking some of the solution and building the confidence of the people or the farmers and 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 we can tap into the available knowledge technologies or the success story we need to have the soil biobanks for sustainable intensification because soil crop microbiome interactions govern the management practices the production potential and sustainability of the uh, sustainable intensification system and there's a whole lot of uh, evidence on how uh, the soil health in, in you know and and sustainable intensification helps in the nutrition and the human health so we need to have comprehensive research uh, you know around those ecological plant production rhizosphere microbiome effects for for sustainable intensification uh the sixth one is harnessing the power of the digital tools i think there are a lot of advancement in the digital tools how digital tools can help in prioritization of the sustainable intensification options and also delivery of those options because sustainable intensification is knowledge intensive that needs uh, digital tools and techniques uh, for taking it forward the data driven uh, agronomic management through through advisory the artificial intelligence the machine learning tools for site specific recommendations for fertilizer for water for <coughs> agrochemical and, and and other tools the seventh uh, you know uh, agenda i would propose is that we need approaches tools and protocols and processes for the ecosystem services uh, making a balance towards uh, the environmental social and economic dimension for example professor lal you know you know talk the whole talk was on the carbon farming and we, we you know the carbon sequestration potential of different soils different agroclimatic conditions varies but i think uh, that may limit uh, the farmers uh, incentive for the carbon credit but in addition to the carbon sequestration if we can uh, go for the life cycle analysis 
uh, and, and capture how much carbon emission mitigation we are having through sustainable intensification that can add to the value to the carbon carbon credit. But we need approaches, tools, protocols, and tracking verification, and of course, enabling policy uh, for mainstream the sustainable intensification in, in research and development plans and capture the carbon uh, sequestered in potential, which can create a pull factor for accelerated adoption of, of the sustainable intensification system. For that, we need to define business models with opportunity. You know, we need to identify the potential niche for scaling and accelerated adoption of the of the sustainable intensification through business models, starting from the mar mar market segmentation uh, to the implementation of those things. And for that, we need comprehensive assessment, assessment for <coughs> consumer perceptions and pre preferences, the market size, whether local level or regional level or the international level, and also the entrepreneurship opportunities for agri not only for the agriculture produce, but also the ecosystem services from, from the sustainable intensification, for example, farm stages. We need to have the strong program on the capacity development, the human resource development, and the certification courses for, for taking the sustainable intensification forward. And for that, we need to have a new cadre of sustainable intensification community of practitioners. Inclusion of the sustainable intensification in, in the core curriculum, development of the inclusive training module, the hands-on training on the bundled sustainable intensification solution, and of course, uh, certification courses or the standards of the excellence on sustainable intensification. Finally, science evidence-based policy and investment, that's something very, very important for scaling sustainable intensification and making uh, drylands resilient. And, and evidence, what I would like to show is the conservation agriculture example, which meets the multiple objectives. If you see the multi-criteria assessment, you know, on all those aspects, but then optimization of those conservation agriculture or sustainable intensification practices requires attention to the location specific performance. As I said on the first point or the first bullet, which was one size doesn't fit all. That means we have the context specific, the recommendations or the adoption of, con of, of those practices. Uh, we try to put, uh, you know, how the different agri food systems contribute to the sustainable development goal. So if you go with the subsistence agriculture or the conventional agriculture that negatively impacts the sustainable development goal. But if you talk about conservation agriculture based sustainable intensification that positively contributes to several of the sustainable development goals directly and other through <coughs> enabling policy. So with this, uh, thank you so much, sir, for this opportunity. I hope uh, I was on, on time. Thank you, Dr. Jyot. Yes, you are very much on time, and maybe there's a time for one question from the audience. Perhaps I could ask you, um, you yes. mentioned sustainable intensification. Some people are focusing on eco-intensification. Do you think there's a difference between the two? And which one of those two, if you have a choice, would prefer for dry land? I think there is no much difference. I think there are different phasing of uh, the terminology around, uh, you know, sustainable intensification or ecological intensification are more or less same. So okay. I, I don't see much, much of the difference between the two. Thank you. We still have a minute for any other question for Dr. Jai. If not, uh, we will come back. Hopefully we'll save time and come back at the end and have some more discussion. Thank you, and we move on to the next speaker, which is Dr. Rao, Dr. Sirino Asa Rao, who is the director of ICR's NARM program in Hyderabad in India, and the title of his presentation is Identification of Appropriate Agro-Management Techniques for Climate Change Adaptation in Tropical Ecosystems. Dr. Rao, it's a pleasure to invite you and give you the floor. Thank you very much, sir. It's a great pleasure uh, to present and the chairmanship of the group. Uh, as suggested that the topic, uh, I will be presenting the, uh, what are the uh, site-specific appropriate agro-management techniques towards uh, climate change adaptation, uh, particularly with reference to tropical ecosystems. As the previous uh, speakers also highlighted that recent uh, uh, IPCC report, and uh, I will not repeat, but one of the caution is that uh, 
for every degree, every uh, one degree rise in temperature, there will be 70, 7 percent in the uh, increase in the intensity, uh, intensification of extreme rain events, which we are seeing in many tropics. Then uh, uh, the tropical ecosystems of the world is a, uh, a key locations where uh, intensive populations, Arctic uh, population is uh, uh, living and uh, we have larger food demand, hunger and poverty are the important features. The carrying capacity ecosystem is relatively low and uh, low agriculture productivity and larger yield gaps are there and the highest climate vulnerability and the rapid increase of extreme climate events are witnessed in this region. Again, uh, these regions, there are some indicators uh, and how uh, the climate change impacts are shown that uh, the, the impact, the extreme rain events are increasing and the temperature of course, and uh, I'll be taking forward how temperature affects in uh, food systems this year and extreme events and sea rise and uh, uh, glaciers. And uh, uh, in fact, in tropics, uh, since it, it presents many uh, developing countries and uh, we have three two important uh, mechanisms, adaptation and uh, mitigation. But uh, basically the presentation is that the climate change adaptation led to mitigation, though many adaptation measures have uh, no benefits of mitigation. When we come to the Indian, broadly see that South Asia and India, that we see, uh, see that the entire India, in fact, is vulnerable to the climate change. It's larger and uh, uh, smaller or larger, but we can see that most of Indian region part is uh, vulnerable to uh, climate change. And recently, last uh, uh, 20, 22 years, we have seen that how extreme climate events which are seen in terms of severe droughts where 23-25% of lesser monsoon. At the same time, uh, the many coastal uh, ecosystems are uh, witnessed with the floods and cyclones. So another important, really alarming feature of the climate change in Indian ecosystem and South Asia is that traditionally the dry regions are witnessed with the flood and the really high rainfall regions are witnessed with the droughts, mid, particularly mid-season droughts. That's why new strategy, new amplifiers are required for climate change adaptation. One of the impacts, what is the economic loss of climate change just in one day? In fact, in coastal, uh, coastal Andhra Pradesh here in Shakapatnam, really uh, the economic loss is 20 billion US dollars because of Kuruhut cyclone, both from infrastructure, agriculture, and uh, other, other components. Recently, uh, one of the important aspects we can see that uh, uh, that the heat wave affects some wheat yields in 2022. Uh, recently, Union Minister of Commerce and Industry, uh, who spoke that the World Economic Forum in uh, May 20, 2022, suggested that uh, what is the what kinds of wheat yield reductions are there uh, due to uh, heat waves during the month of uh, March. The estimations are that uh, at, at least we we get uh, uh, around 78. Uh, a million tons of wheat yields this year. Climate change and uh, agriculture not only uh, affects uh, agriculture per se, that uh, uh, it also affects uh, all subsectors like horticulture, in fact, livestock, poultry, and fisheries. In terms of seawater intrusion, India has 7,200 kilometers of coastline, and a lot of uh, hailstorm effects are there and uh, coming intensively horticulture system with heat wave, flood cyclones, and the droughts. So agro management technologies are critical role in climate change adaptation for food security and SDGs. And uh, first the most important priority for the tropics is the water issue. We can see here that uh, where uh, the tropics are seen, particularly in South East countries and Middle East uh, countries, uh, the 17 most water, uh, world water stress countries in tropical ecosystems, uh, almost 50 to 60 percent of India is under uh, faces high, extremely uh, water stress situation. And uh, at the same time, India more than 55 to 60 percent is rain dependent agriculture. So uh, the technology is very, very important. The, uh, when we talk about water the crisis for the sustainable agriculture in critical rain fed system in tropics, uh, the important mechanism is uh, we have one meter rainfall average 
uh, but how to retain that uh, uh, small bird as a farmer in slopey land and how to conserve and how to saturate into the soil surface is important technology how in situ water harvesting in the land treatment how to retain and store recharge and re reuse and efficient use is a philosophy of uh, integrated watershed watershed management in the tropics we can see here that uh, very very important technology in fact government of india is taking that compound technology the land requirement is 5 to 7 per city takes uh, per compound when we are getting the intensive in fact uh, uh, in four months five months crop season instead of that at least 15 to 20 rainy events now what is happening is hardly three to four rainy events are having whenever rainy extreme rainy events are happening that we want to we want to restore and we want to utilize life saving irrigation during mid season drought sir one of the important study indicates that one life saving irrigate irrigation gives 25 to 35 percent of yield increase in several rain fed uh, crops then uh, once we see that in fact intensively the micro irrigation is promoted in india and uh, wherever water is the crisis in rain fed the dry land systems micro irrigation utilization is very very intensive Uh, it is estimated that with micro and pressurized irrigation that the uh, water utilization can be enhanced 5 to 10 times depending upon the crops then another important target which is coming up to the multiple uses of water harvested in farm town not only for groundwater recharge and we can also go for pitch and duck and other culture so that same water can be again reutilized for the um, agriculture purpose so it uses it uh, contributes to groundwater recharge and also fish production and also duck production and also other the boundary vegetable cultivation and also irrigation so that is the way we would like to see that uh, the technologies in intensively implemented multiple uses of water and once the, the when uh, and i said that 55 to 60% of the uh, very very water stressed uh, uh, parts in india we when we have different components and the integrated farming system where livestock and horticulture and annual crops are there we would like to see that uh, priority of this water utilization should be given to the animals followed by horticulture then annual uh, cereal crops second important component how to restore and the resilience capacity to the soil system in fact uh, uh, most of the tropics particularly south asia indian systems are very poor in soil organic carbon what we suggest to the land departments is that the any any human being if uh, heart is weak that the how is performing functionally in the week so that is the way we explain that when soils are very low with organic carbon overall the power of the soil to produce is very very good so we need to see that utmost to that how to increase carbon so along with the carbon soil fertility soil health can be increased so one of the important aspect in fact uh, 10 years back 15 years back we used to see that uh, larger percent of crop in situ used to be burnt and nowadays the uh, several government programs have come and uh, lot of uh, crop residue is being re recycled in fact uh, i take one example that around 20 million tons of sugarcane crash used to be uh, go waste out of farm uh, around 7 years back now intensively it is being used as a mulch come manuring in the state of maharashtra typical dry land region so another important aspect is coming the technology is taken to the small holder farmers wherever the residue is there they are using with the drum technique and converting to biochar and adding as a amendment the larger benefits are derived as a water retention and really water storage during mid season drought and store the carbon improvement and limited enrichment sir it is estimated that by improving soil carbon in a one one meter profile i think we can really cover many crops we can really improve the groundnut finger millet to fennel millet to rice supply and rice the food security can be improved and we have seen that it is not that once recommended the in fact uh, the organic matter sources should be on farm local ecosystem based so these are the different uh, uh, species for example how to improve how to generate on farm and and the uh, these things for example cover crop very very important in fact around 8 million hectares of area in different rain fed regions where the cover crop can be taken as 
the source of organic matter, uh, just to take an example of one signal. And uh, the soil erosion, when I said that the high intensity rise is going with the soil erosion, we would like to see that uh, the largest expanded program, MG Narega is there. We want to see that the larger parts are covered, restoration of degraded land uh, by uh, recycling the tanks. Here, one example we can see here that when soil tank site is eroded, fine soil is used, when we are bringing grass to the soil, soil cover is uh, Soil color is changed, productivity is enhanced, the carbon content is increased, fertility is increased. So we need to see that what are the policy implementations that every uh, every year, we, uh, every after one year, these tank sites can be recycled to the farmland. So another important thing is that uh, though uh, conservation agriculture, we all agree that it is a, it's a tonic for the sustainable issues and soil health issues. But uh, one of the critical factors in uh, uh, conservation agriculture, typical drylands in uh, light active light soil is the termites. The crop residue is eaten by the termites. But despite of that problem, still we are getting, once we are leaving the crop residue on the soil, 10 to 15 percent is retained in the nest crop is there. That really contributes into this monocrop area, into the double crop and the economic benefits and the soil health benefits are enhanced. This is the one example when we have taken typical rice bed, uh, paddy rice systems is converted into integrated farming system when we included multi-commodity farming, uh, uh, legumes and horticulture crops and the fish and the duck systems and the farm farms. The productivity enhanced, resilience capacity is enhanced. Even if it, one system is failed, another system is uh, coming up, including backyard poultry. The another important uh, aspect is that uh, as per the Indian ag agro forestry policy, we need to cover the 30 percent of forest cover. So there is a scope uh, 10 percent uh, that limit. So we are really countries moving to bridge this gap to agroforestry systems, which really can provide security and stability of the farm income that was estimated recently. We would like to see that multiple stress salary, as I indicated nowadays, the typical dry regions are also affected with the flood, and the flood regions, the high intensity regions are affected with the drought. So we wanted to see that the multiple stress tolerance, uh, either crop varieties and breeds and other species. In fact, under NICRA project, many uh, varieties, many, many germplasms, many uh, these uh, things are available, which are under practice implemented now. Fodder system, in fact, uh, in terms of 62% uh, methane is emitted uh, from the livestock sector, and we would like to see that uh, the efficient fodder system at least to replace uh, one third of green fodder to reduce uh, uh, not only productivity enhancement and methane detection and overall resilience capacity. Agro advisories, in fact, large scale we are implementing, in, in fact, not only district level, mandal level, village level, weekend summit is coming up under the um, various schemes, and uh, this can really risk aversion is uh, possible. And uh, India is, in fact, one of the countries where climate resilience villages were established, uh, ICR systems where weather, water, crop, fertilizer, carbon, and uh, village institutions are important. Really, these things are being replicated. For example, the, uh, we have established 151 villages. For just example, one state of Maharashtra replicated 5,000 villages with 5,000 large scale investment recently. And okay, another, two minutes, please. Yes, sir. Another yes. important aspect is uh, we have developed an agriculture contingency plan for all 650 districts. Uh, and these are being implemented. Some of the states are very, very important, proactively implementing towards the climate preparedness. And these plans we have extended to the target countries, other countries now to implement. And this is the when, uh, UNFCC climate negotiations, when uh, this workshop was there. In fact, this is India is the first country which has developed and implemented agriculture contingency plans at the ground level. Integration of agrotechnics is very, very important, not only tolerant varieties, but integration of uh, uh, genetic material as well as soil, water, weather, and the storage incidents when we culminated all these things, the overall resilience capacity is completed. The last but one slide, I would like to see that for India kind of uh, lesser storage systems, we are getting one third 
but it lost at india level we have more than 600 uh, agri startups now we want to see that valuation cost norm itself we are hosting 103 uh, 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 agri startups and we are helping how valuation processing storing is possible we'd like to see that uh, put loss reduction to agri startups and uh, overall the framework for climate preparedness is that we need r and d of course research and development education we are targeting students and younger students uh, uh, school education and also uh, other private colleges capacity building and uh, training community sensitization and the policy development and through sensitization of policy makers large scale implementation of these climate adaptation practices at the village levels are implemented thank you very much thank you dr rao for excellent uh, presentation lot of material uh, very useful hopefully we'll come back for discussion uh, at the end of the session so we can move on to dr slack's presentation donald slack Uh, who is a professor emeritus of biosystem engineering watershed management eco hydrology air and land resources sciences civil engineering and architectural engineering and mechanics at university of arizona the title of presentation is water for agriculture in the face of mega drought in the southwestern usa dr slack the floor is yours for 15 minutes thank you very much uh, Thank you very much Dr. Lau. Uh actually what I'm going to do I'm probably deviating a little bit from uh, some of the other presentations as I'm giving you an overview of of what's going on in the southwest US in terms of agriculture and water. And uh I think it was mentioned earlier uh about the 1200 year mega drought that's uh ongoing in the western US and it's a little bit more than the southwestern US it includes uh California, uh Nevada, uh Utah, Arizona, and as you can see it moves over into Texas and and some of the high plains. Uh it particularly affects agriculture production in California and Arizona, however. Uh in Arizona we rely on uh water from the Colorado River primarily for our agriculture. Uh California relies on that for its agriculture in the southern part of the state. uh and as you can see from this slide uh that drought has been ongoing for a long time and in 2015 it was a very severe drought um in california california is the largest agriculture product producing uh state in the US it has a 50 billion dollar revenue for agriculture and produces over 400 uh commodity crops which are grown across the state and that includes fruits and vegetables and nuts uh, as well as other products of livestock. Arizona has important agricultural production particularly in the along the Colorado River and in central Arizona. Uh Arizona produces uh, over 90% of the leafy green vegetables grown in the United States in the winter time and uh, 100% of the iceberg lettuce crop that's produced in the US is grown near Yuma, Arizona. And that all uses water from the Colorado River. Uh Irrigation water for California comes from two major uh sources the mountains of uh, northern California and the Sierra Nevada provide water for the Central Valley and the Colorado River provides water for the Imperial Valley in southern California and for the metropolitan areas of Los Angeles and San Diego so metropolitan areas are a very large water user for water resources in California as well as in Arizona in California the drought has resulted in significant reductions in the amount of water available for agriculture from these irrigation systems uh a reduction of 25 to 75% of the water in some areas and this is of course for irrigation this is for some farmers to remove orchard crops and actually strangely enough some of them have moved to Arizona water for uh, Arizona and southern California comes from the Colorado River uh and give you a little overview of the Colorado River here and uh, unfortunately this slide gives you uh quantities in terms of millions of acre feet an acre foot is roughly equal to 1230 cubic meters of water uh and as you can see the Colorado River includes seven 
uh, basin includes seven states with the headwaters in Wyoming, near Yellowstone National Park, uh, and also significant contributions to the water from Colorado. All of this area has been affected by the mega drought. So the, the mega drought that we're experiencing actually uh, is comprised of three of the types of droughts that Dr. Lal mentioned. Uh, of course, the meteorological drought is restricted the amount of water that is falling on the watersheds uh, and that leads to a hydrological drought which reduces the steam stream flow and then the use of water by our large metropolitan areas of Phoenix, Tucson, Los Angeles and San Diego uh, actually is contributing to a sociological drought. So we have all of those uh, uh, one of the problems with the Colorado River water system is that in the 1922 Colorado River Compact, the water was divided up amongst the upper states and the lower states. And at the time they calculated the uh, annual flow of water in the Colorado River to be 15 million acre feet, which was averaged over the previous 10 years. And that was an unusual wet period the Colorado River uh, really doesn't flow that much and, and hadn't been flowing that much over the 30 year period at that time. On top of that, then in uh, 1940, uh, 1944, Mexico was added to the allocation and they just added another 1.5 million acre feet. So they brought the total allocation to 16 and a half million acre feet where, when in fact the river only flows uh, around 12 to 14 million acre feet uh, per year. And of course, it's over allocated in terms of uh, transferring water outside of the basin. Uh, the Front Range of Colorado gets water. Uh, there's a Chama project in New Mexico that gets a lot of water. And as I mentioned, uh, the Imperial Valley in California and the cities of Los Angeles and San Diego take water from the Colorado River. So we used to say that the Colorado River was the Nile of the American Southwest, uh, but it's a very over allocated Nile. This shows you uh, the water availability of the Colorado River system and how it's declined just over the last three years. In 2019, there were uh, 36.9 billion cubic meters in storage in the reservoir systems along the Colorado. Two major reservoirs, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, are the ones that uh, are generally operated to provide water and electricity to the Southwest. By 2022, that had declined to 22.4 billion cubic meters, which is a reduction of 39%. And as, as mentioned, this has been ongoing because even in 2019, there has been a significant reduction over the long-term storage in those reservoirs. Central Arizona, uh, irrigated areas uh, from Phoenix, uh, which is this area um, on this map, southward towards uh, Tucson includes an area here that's called the Pinal County in central Arizona. And there grow some winter vegetables there and small amounts of maize and wheat, but uh, alfalfa and cotton were pr traditionally the major crops that are grown there. And although the Phoenix area receives a significant amount of their water from the Salt River Project, which is fed by the Salt River, which flows out of the White Mountains in eastern Arizona. Uh, central, the Pinal County and the Tucson area now receive all of their water from the Colorado River via the Central Arizona Project. And formerly, uh, Tucson and the Pinal County relied solely on groundwater. Uh, this is the quick view of the Central Arizona Project, which uh, was a series of dams and canals that was authorized in 1968 and completed uh, in 1993 at a cost of $4 billion, a, a canal of 336 miles in length, which brings water from the Colorado River to just south of Tucson. And although the justification for that project was water for agriculture in Central Arizona, most of the water now serves the urban areas of Greater Phoenix and uh, Tucson. So there's a significant competition for water uh, 
between the metropolitan areas and the agriculture. In southeast Arizona, uh, the total amount of water for irrigation comes from groundwater. There are two areas, the Sulphur Springs Valley and the Sulphur Springs Valley Aquifer and the Douglas Aquifer. And it, if you look closely, you can see a number of little dots there. Uh, those are center pivot irrigation systems that use uh, totally use groundwater. There's a single farm in the, uh, this area, just south of the, the playa or the dry lake bed here that uh, has 198 center pivots and uh, farms that contributes water for a little over 10,000 hectares. Within the past five years, this area has seen an influx of farmers from California moving their nut crops, primarily pecans from California because they were running out of water there. And there are no regulations controlling the withdrawal of groundwater in this area. So it's being heavily over exploited and probably will largely be depleted in 25 to 40 years unless uh, some measures are taken to control the withdrawals. These are just a couple of the current crops. Uh, cotton has been a major crop in central Arizona and lettuce uh, grown along the Colorado River, as I mentioned, is, is a major crop in that area. Alternatives and consequences to what's happening, the reductions in, of irrigation water, the Central Arizona project is going to be taking reductions of at least 21% in the 2023. The farmers face several options. They can fallow, they won't plant much of all of their farmland. They can change to a new crop, which uses less water and install water savings irrigation systems such as subsurface drip where soils allow. And, and in fact, the state of Arizona is committed to subsidizing farmers to do that. This is just a view of a California almond orchard, which was abandoned due to the lack of irrigation water. So there were thousands of acres in California that uh, actually gave up their nut crops. This was a headline from uh, the Arizona Daily Star in July uh, 2022. Farmers are fill fearful of their Colorado River cuts. And this was primarily farmers along the lower Colorado River. Uh, there has been a, a transition to subsurface drip for cotton and other crops in central Arizona over the last six or seven years, uh, as shown in this slide. And there is significant uh, interest in crop substitution. Waiuli is being considered as a cash crop alternative to cotton. Uh, the Bridgestone Tire Company has a research facility and a plant in Goodyear, Arizona, and they are actually contracting with farmers to grow Waiuli. Uh, and so there's a good chance that this will that this will be an alternative crop if there is water available. It uses only about half the amount of water of cotton. And some of you probably know triticale, which is uh, is being considered as an alternative forage crop to corn or maize, and uh, that Coronado dairy that I mentioned in Southeast Arizona is looking at using uh, triticale as a fresh chop forage for dairy cattle. So in summary, uh, that was a very quick overview, but a, a mega drought, which has persisted in the Western US and particularly the Southwest US for the last 20 years, has significantly reduced water availability in the Colorado River Basin and in Central and Southern California. Reduction of water allocations to farmers in this region have ranged from 25 to 75% and will continue. And that's significant because crops can only be produced with irrigation in most of this region. We don't have rain fed agriculture here other than range crops. To cope with this lack of water, farmers are faced with several alternatives. They can quit farming and many of them have or will. They'll follow much of their crop land. They don't plant all of their land to crops. They switch to lower water use crops, which I mentioned, and switching to water saving irrigation technologies sub such as subsurface drip irrigation. That was a very quick uh, overview and I'd be happy to entertain any questions if, if there's Thank time. You. Dr. Slack, that was an excellent presentation. Very good summary of the mega drought situation and how to address it in your last slide. We do have a time for one question. Yes, um, yes. Professor Lel, I would like to ask uh, Don uh, about the tension between urban and rural. I remember Dr. Hogan uh, 
in UC Davis, they always arbitrate between this tension uh, in California uh, between people in, um, in cities and uh, the rulers uh, of California. The same is happening in Arizona. But this is reflected even in, uh, in, in the major rivers around the world. This tension is going to increase. My question is uh, the way out of it, because this sometimes trigger fighting like in Sudan, because between the um, uh, people who are doing grazing and settlers in agriculture. Thank you. Dr. Slack, please, very short answer. Yes, well, that's a very good question. <laughs> and I don't have a very good answer. That it, it, it's, I'm afraid that that tension is going to increase. And uh, what's happening in, uh, in the US at least is that uh, the urban areas are winning out. Uh, they have more political power than the farmers. And, and so uh, that's why farmers are going out of business. Uh, the, the urban areas haven't given a lot of thought to where they're going to get their lettuce and their and their their food from. But uh, so when we go out of business, when the farmers go out of business, they'll have to eat something besides lettuce. But thank you, sir. This is thank an answer. Yes. I, I'm sorry, we are going to move on. Thank you so much. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Hadid, Dr. Ayman Abu Hadid, emeritus professor at the Arid Lands Agricultural Studies and Research Institute. And Shams University, Cairo, and former Minister of Agriculture of Egypt. The title of presentation, Use of Smart Agriculture to Improve Water Use Efficiency and Energy Saving Under Climate Change Challenge in Egypt. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, um, uh, Professor Lal, I think uh, uh, Professor Abghani Gindi is, um, is doing this because it's joint paper between the two of them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, the reception is good. So, sorry. I think this slide uh, summarizes what is the concept of uh, precision and the digital uh, agriculture. Just to summarize, but. Uh, as we know that the agriculture is a major uh, consumer of the water. For example, in Egypt, we used more than 80% uh, per uh, year. Uh, and some African countries already reach the water poverty. For example, in Egypt, we reach uh, less than 535 cubic meters per year per capita. So how to solve this problem? We are facing, we, yeah, the problem can be solved by to add new water resources, and it is very difficult, but or to improve the water management techniques in order to save any wasted water. I think the second solution is better. Uh, this is a climate, sh climate change and the effect of the agriculture, I think, the effect will be on uh, increasing the evapotranspiration or water consumption of most of uh, uh, crops, and in the same time reducing the uh, yield of most of uh, crops except cotton. This is a, a slide for Dr. Ayman Wahadi. The concept, the, the concept of the, uh, what, what's the meaning of the precision agriculture is how to apply, are we applying accurate agriculture inputs, starting from land preparation up to harvesting, including selection of the accurate seeds, water, fertilizer, and all of the agriculture inputs. While the, the, the digital or the agriculture concept how that use of the information and the communication technology. <clears throat> the concept of the irrigation or smart irrigation 
how to control using some techniques like estimating or estimating the water uh, consumption using the weather station or the high tech weather station. Sometimes use the uh, soil blob or soil sensor to control or to control or to control the water apply. In Egypt, this is for Egypt, the traditional irrigation, the efficiency of the traditional irrigation is about average 50%. This is very, very low. Uh, for uh, sprinkler irrigation or for brushalized irrigation, I think that we can reach 85% up to 92% uh, for localized irrigation system. And I, I am going to explain the modification of the surface irrigation, how to increase the uh, efficiency from 50% up to 80%. This is a, a software for Precision agriculture, for as, I, as I mentioned before, that we have to use like, accurate inputs, and in the, in, you can uh, reach or you can uh, obtain a good package for how to deal with agriculture. <coughs> These are for uh, a weather station or satellite weather station. This is a slide show how to use the soil blob or soil sensor blob to operate uh, any of the brushalized irrigation system. Thus, you can uh, see the satellite and you can use directly to the to operate the uh, sprinkler system or central pivot to that. <coughs> this is a very new uh, devices for estimating evapotranspiration. Uh, it is a self flow. It is independent on how to, you, to estimate or to measure the velocity of the uh, liquid in the stream of the. It is a very, very new, uh, new device for it. These are some flow sensors using a smart irrigation to control the water, to control the time, control the amount. As you see, some solenoid valves, some controllers, some uh, digital uh, or central control, some digital water uh, measured or water uh, flow measured. Now I am going to what happened in Egypt to save more water or to use or to introduce a smart uh, agriculture. We have about four mega project or national project. The first one developing and mutualizing the own farm irrigation system uh, is already started and for developing about, about 5 million fadans in Delta, in, new, in, in old land. The second one is the reclamation of desert and developing the of irrigation system is about five, uh, 400, 4 million fadans. The third one, uh, the protected agriculture and the project include about 100,000 fed dens. The last one, uh, the implementation of forest and the development of the sustainable forest in desert land using a tree that stores water. Now, we are, uh, start with the, the first one. These are some, some irrigation problem in Egypt, at least, in, when you use a traditional, traditional method for irrigation. Uh, now, as I mentioned, that uh, the, the mega project or the national project for developing the uh, traditional method, uh, many, many, many objectives, at least raising the efficiency of on-farm irrigation system, as I mentioned before, from 50 up to 80 uh, percent. Saving against the possible quantity of water, as um, Dr. Adil mentioned, that we can save uh, about 10 10 billion, 10 milliard cubic meter per year, per year by the end of the development of the five uh, million per day. The techniques, the techniques, the techniques, the techniques, the 
these techniques that we use only instead of. We used one point, lifting point, or one, one lifting point. We replaced all the open channel, Mesca and Marwa by underground piping system, and I think that it is save more water. We introduce the laser techniques for leveling. We, for the applying localized irrigation only for horticultural crops in the Delta. Uh, the uh, cultivation on uh, mechanized raised and wide beds, uh, applying search flow and using climate Okay, these are the, the summary of the, 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 modifi the modification of surface irrigation or traditional irrigation method. We introduced, we, as, as I mentioned, that we replacing the, the open channel by open mesca and marwa by biotic system underground. We use the laser techniques or laser leveling. Uh, we use the gated pipes for distribution water and the, the there is the raised bed. The raised bed, we have a many, many uh, research about the raised bed. We save about 20% of applied water with increasing the, the yield of wheat by 17%. This is a very, a very many, many uh, localized irrigation system. Uh, drip irrigation, bubbler, uh, mini sprinkler. Uh, it it depends on how to replace or how to change from surface irrigation in horticulture and delta to the modern irrigation or to pressurized irrigation system. The second one, this is uh, the, recla uh, the reclamation of desert. We have uh, uh, half million Fadan in Toshka and one and a half million Fadan is a new project, plus uh, half million Fadan in Mustaqbal and Musk, and the, the last one is uh, 2.3 million Fadan for a new delta. In, the, in, in, reclaim, in the reclamation or reclaim the project, we must use only the brushalized irrigation system, and it is easy to control the water and use the smart irrigation with the specialized irrigation system. So it is a central pivot or linear or localized irrigation system was different. This is a uh, integrate, integrated management project in the area where the water, water as water quality with high salinity water. You can use for fish, fish uh, farming production, and you can take the water from the farm uh, for the aquaculture to the uh, plant or the crops. This is this, uh, uh, the using of the solar energy. The third one, the protect agriculture, as I mentioned, we have, uh, we started already 100 million fadans. And the, the good example for water saving, water and, and energy saving. And, uh, greenhouse more yield was with similar or less inputs, improving green design. Increase in yield up to three times. It's a slide for Dr. Ayman Abu Hadid. The shading, I think as the, uh, De decreasing or reducing the, the water uh, consumption. The semi-closed green can save water, we can collect the rain. Doctor, give me uh, two minutes, please. Two minutes, okay. <laughs> this is an example for a greenhouse. For, for example, for tomato. Tomato, you, uh, for, for produce one kilogram for tomato, if you, in traditional irrigation method, you use about 162 liters for one kilo. 
for labor vacation in the 63, for soilless or for greenhouses, I think as 40 liters to produce one kilogram. Oh my gosh. This is a plant factory, has a modified atmosphere, temperature control, LED lights. Field, what is this? Uh, basic water needs uh, for drinking uh, for 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 person for one person as two up to four for house uh, household forty up to forty uh, forty up to four hundred for food one thousand up to five thousand. The second one is one liter of water produce one kilogram one kilocalorie. While to produce one kilogram for wheat you use 1,500. For meat or beef, you use about 15,000 cubic uh, liter to produce one kilogram. As the last, uh, the establish of plantation, and uh, uh, so the, the for British agriculture, now we use a smart machineries. A big smart machine is now satellite. We a drone. If it, if it is uh, available in Egypt, I think it is uh, up to now. It is very difficult. This is a harvesting. a very smart harvest machine. So the last one is how to transfer the the transfer the technology. I think ex expanding the establishment of and building or capacity building. Create short courses, uh, use the visual, modify the bylaw of the program and faculties. Uh, I think as like uh, uh, GIS, like remote sensing, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, modeling, expert, I think. Please try to conclude okay, if okay. I may request. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very comprehensive. Uh, digital staining water techniques, and hopefully we'll come back to you for some questions. The last speaker is Dr. Abdul Hamid. And Dr. Hamid is um, Abdul Hamid is a research professor and head of the Botany Department of the National Research Center in Cairo, Egypt. The title is Biosaline Agriculture as an opportunity for the sustainable development of rural areas and coastal regions. Dr. Abdul Hamid, the floor is yours. Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, introduction. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Adil for uh, kind inv invitation uh, to be here. Uh, my talk today uh, about uh, saline agriculture uh, in Egypt and all over the world. I tried to simplify uh, this issue and uh, show in a few slides, and I hope to success to uh, to get a brief introduction and summary about the current situation of uh, uh, biosaline agriculture. Uh, climate change uh, may have direct effect on water quantity in Egypt and uh, which lead to uh, indirect effect in Mediterranean uh, salt water intrusions to ground water with exposed to agriculture and uh, vulnerability. Uh, soil salinity is crucial problem, uh, not in Egypt, but in many uh, areas uh, all over the world. Uh, especially in Egypt, when we talk in Egypt about uh, salt-affected soil, uh, I think around one-fourth or one-third of agricultural land in Egypt is salt-affected soil. So this issue is very crucial to Egypt. So uh, this issue needs, uh, we have to pay attention and deal very, very well with this issue because as I mentioned, around one third of agricultural land, which 
uh, uh, represent around 10 million acres uh, is salt affected. Uh, most of uh, salt affected soil in Egypt located in uh, Delta, either in North or Eastern or Western and El Fayum and some other uh, uh, different locations. Uh, this is the component and uh, area of salt affected soil in Egypt. So we need to adapt for this situation and deal how uh, and invent a new strategy to deal with this issue. Uh, first, we have to, uh, uh, to define what salt affected soil. What are salt affected soil? Salt affected soil, uh, in, in briefly, uh, includes different type of, uh, of salinity, uh, saline, sodic, and saline sodic soils, and many subcategories. Uh, saline soil contains uh, excessive uh, ion of soil, especially mainly uh, 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 sodium and chloride and other uh, uh, not main uh, ions. And uh, in this figure, uh, this is, uh, illustrates uh, uh, the impact of, uh, of salt in plant growth. Uh, the explain uh, briefly uh, how to affect the salt on uh, the health of the plant. Uh, there is uh, no much water. The, uh, the plant can't absorb water, even the, uh, the nutrient is available, but the plant can't absorb, and there is no uh, enough uh, uh, air, so there is no aeration, and at the end, the plant will be wilted because the plant can't absorb and take uh, up the, the water. What are the main causes of salt-affected soil? Salt-affected soil can be uh, a reason of, can be naturally, uh, can be uh, uh, due to uh, uh, not efficient irrigation system uh, or uh, no uh, drainage system uh, or uh, not efficient irrigation. So there are uh, many uh, type for uh, the reason of uh, <coughs> salt uh, uh, salinity in the uh, in the soil. Uh, this figures also uh, illustrate the factor influencing and effect on accumulation uh, in the soil. Uh, so, uh, arid, uh, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, salinity uh, salinization and salt affected soil is mainly in arid and semi-arid region. So th that, that's very clear for all that uh, this area, the dry area, uh, is affected with this type of uh, stresses. Uh, what are the impact of salt affected soil? Salt affected soil is a serious problem, as I mentioned and can affect the ecosystem and uh, agricultural productivity and decrease the ability and buffer and filter against contaminant and degraded soil structure. There are many types for uh, 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 influence of uh, uh, salinity in the plant and the ecosystem itself. So at the end, that will affect the agricultural productivity. The way we find uh, that's uh, important to know the current situation and situation of uh, salinization and salt affected soil or, or over the world. Uh, they for all, uh, uh, created as soil map for salt affected soil and uh, and we'll show this next slides. They have some techniques for creating this. Uh, <coughs> Uh, this uh, uh, photo and figures show the uh, salinity uh, situation uh, where salinity uh, concentrate and uh, uh, in the upper uh, 30 centimeters. And this uh, shows the uh, salinity in the upper uh, from 30 to uh, 100 uh, centimeters. So Egypt is clear uh, 
affected with salinity stress. This is another also to prove the uh, uh, situation of uh, uh, salinity and all over the world. And Egypt is, uh, there are many area around the world, in US and Latin America and North Africa and South Africa and Asia and uh, uh, West Asia and Australia also. The reason for the number, uh, also uh, one of reason of salinity is, uh, 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 as I mentioned, the reason of salinity and the salinization is the scarcity of water. So this is uh, 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 dominant uh, in uh, arid and semi-arid region. So uh, the, 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 the area with uh, red color, this is affected and uh, have uh, less amount of uh, precipitation, so less amount of rainfall, so they are suffering from uh, salinity. So the map uh, created by FAO uh, explains that uh, more than 400 million hectares uh, uh, salt affected and more than 800 million hectares of subsoil are salt affected soil in general. Uh, the classification of the uh, salt affected soil is uh, have, we have uh, dif uh, different around uh, more than once the American uh, classification and uh, FAO classification and Australian also. So uh, for uh, either for uh, irrigation water quality or salt affected soil. So, uh, but we have here we, in, in Egypt, we, we use both sometimes. We use uh, FAO uh, classification, sometimes we use uh, US classifications. And uh, this uh, also explains the uh, FAO uh, uh, classification, but with, uh, with sensitivity to crop, protectivity of crop under different salinization levels. Uh, so moderate, uh, <coughs> uh, moderate salinity, uh, we can grow uh, uh, some uh, not tolerant, we can sensitive and with strong, we can uh, grow uh, tolerant crops. This is the area of salt affected soil and distribution all over the world. As we, we hear, uh, we see that MENA is more than, in top soil, more than uh, 97 uh, million hectares salt affected, the area we are living. Uh, and next the slides, next few, uh, 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 few slides, I will show some uh, uh, some figures, some result uh, through my project, our project uh, funded from uh, from uh, Egyptian Academy of Science and Technology. Uh, this project uh, created and this it was a call for uh, Nida for uh, dealing with uh, COVID. Uh, in 2020 to deal with this area in the new land uh, effect, with salt affected soil due to uh, ground saline water. Uh, the, the, the place of this uh, uh, biolot uh, uh, plant for this, it was in Mogra. And Mogra Oasis, because Mogra Oasis is uh, the location uh, uh, below the uh, Marsa Matroh, uh, around uh, 50, 54 uh, kilometers. And this is, uh, uh, the soil is good itself because now we are working in this project for more than one year. But the problem there is the saline groundwater. The saline groundwater reached to uh, till uh, 12,000 uh, uh, BBM. So, uh, but the, uh, there is a situation is different, that means uh, we have different, we have variation in the salinity, salinity groundwater. Saline groundwater is different. We can find some, uh, uh, some wells with uh, 2000 BBM until uh, 12. So uh, the, the call 
So we established a farm model to guide the, uh, the, the farmers and the investors there in Bogra uh, how to use, uh, how to deal with uh, this condition with, uh, uh, with saline groundwater. Dr. Hamid, you have two minutes, please. Yes, I, yes, I, I will finish, yes. Uh, Mora uh, is uh, uh, within the 1,000.5 million uh, uh, acres. Uh, this is uh, uh, the plan of the government to reclaim new land. Uh, we, we established uh, desalination uh, 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 plant and uh, because uh, we found the uh, saline groundwater reached to uh, 8,000 BBM. So we can to grow uh, crops. So we uh, established uh, desalination plant and we uh, diluted the water to get uh, uh, around 4,000 to grow and to test some crops and some trees. Uh, we grown olive and succeeded till now. Uh, jojoba also can work well. And uh, barley, yeah. And uh, quinoa. And this is uh, canola. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, finally, this, this summer we grow uh, rice, but not uh, uh, regular rice. This is orz uh, al uh, as you said. Uh, uh, they don't need much water. They need also, uh, only uh, 3,000 uh, cubic meter per uh, acres. Uh, around one third of irregular required water in uh, Delta. Uh, the water over uh, come from the well uh, directly. We, we used to uh, for fish uh, farming. We established fish farming. So we have a strategy, we have agenda so to, to sum the conclusion about this issue, uh, not in Egypt and over the world. Uh, we argue that agenda for food production and the saline condition should be transdisciplinary and the multinational covering field experiment as well as a socio, uh, socioeconomics research and policy evaluations. Uh, the following field for investment and the capacity building and the research development are so important, we should pay attention for that. Uh, for example, identifying and improving soil tolerance crop variety, that's a very important issue and uh, issues and innovation in farming practice. Uh, evaluation and innovation considering full value uh, chain uh, and field testing and large scale pilot project and uh, creation and the implementation in best opportunity. Uh, this uh, figures illustrate how uh, different stakeholders and different sci uh, scientific discipline could work together. In conclusion, we can uh, sum up and summarize uh, uh, this uh, work. The opportunity to produce food and fuel and forage and fiber uh, under saline soil and water condition deserve much more attention to an international and national level for four reasons. The need for, to address the growing fresh, uh, uh, fresh water scarcity, the need to stop the loss uh, of biodiversity while meeting the growing food demand, the need uh, to adapt to climate change and uh, force to increasing the capacity to produce food under saline uh, soil and water condition. Okay. And uh, two lines, just one minute, uh, two lines to invest, uh, investment are recommended to address this challenge, capacity building and strengthening the international uh, community, including its national and local stockholder, and the strengthening uh, existing and setting up new expertise uh, centers in particular through a combination of two agenda, uh, climate change adaptation and saline agriculture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abdel Hamid. Thank you, that was a very useful presentation. Uh, I'd need a clarification from management. Dr. Baltagi, is, uh, do we have another 13 minutes? According to my time schedule, we should have 13 minutes left for general questions. Although we are over time, if we started 15 minutes late. Yes, I think it's, uh, we can take about 10 minutes because we have the African Young uh, platform. We'll start after that. 
we can take 10 minutes for Q and A. Thank you, 10 minutes for Q and A. And I would give one question for each of the speakers, beginning with Dean Galzaza. One question, short question, short answer. Okay. Is there a question? Yes. Uh, the, the first question for yourself itself, please. Uh, uh, I back, uh, we uh, <laughs> you, okay, okay. I'll come back if there's a time left. Okay. I don't, I don't see any question. Okay. All right. Then we move on to Dr. Jobs. One question for Dr. Jobs. If not, I will ask a brief question. You mentioned optimization of conservation agriculture. Could you please explain what that means in the context of dryland agriculture? Very short answer. Uh, when I say optimization, what variety uh, the fertile alternatives of the plant does those component technologies are uh, over and above the three interrelated principles of conservation agriculture. I think that's something important. It's, it's not like one size fits, you know, fits all. You, know, you need adapted variety, adapted water management, adapted nutrient management. And this will be uh, context specific, uh, farmer specific, <coughs> uh, like a variety is what we take. So that optimization is important. Thank you, Dr. Jar. Dr. Rao, one question for Dr. Srinivasa. If not, I want a clarification. You mentioned soil erosion was a major problem in the dryland semi-arid region of India. What is a practical solution to control it? Sir, uh, uh, one of the important uh, Measure we are taking is that uh, crop, our crops we are promoting. In fact, uh, uh, in different ecosystems, we have uh, some uh, off season rainfall which is available. Uh, during that time, we would like to take like uh, legume cover crops and uh, either incorporation or leaving on the soil to cover. Uh, that is important strategy which is being promoted in several rice. Right Thank you. Okay, I was hoping the answer might be conservation agriculture, but uh, there is no time to discuss that. One question for Dr. Slack. If there is none, I would like a clarification, please. Um, desalinization of water has been used very, very uh, productively in some parts of the dryland agriculture. Is that an option during the mega drought area? Are there economic way to desalinize water and use it for multiple purposes, including? Well, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, there is a fairly large desalinization plant at San Diego, which produces water uh, for them. And uh, our governor uh, in Arizona as one of the uh, things that he wants to investigate is the use of uh, desalinized water, which would probably come from the Gulf of California uh, or the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And that would be for municipal use. And then the, the water that is saved from uh, the river and so forth could be used for agriculture. Although the, uh, uh, an alternative that is certainly being pushed now is the use of gray water and uh, to some extent, black water for agricultural use in, in uh, Arizona, especially. Thank you. I think that would be very, the recycling yes. gray water would be very useful. Thank you, yes. sir. I want to move on to Dr. Algindi. Any one question for Dr. Algindi? Just, uh, uh, yes. Professor Lal, just uh, what Dr. Gindi was uh, describing and he was aiming at is. Uh, a national program for optimizing water use, um, which is coupled with intensification, which is coupled of a holistic strategy 
um, aiming at optimization of income for small farmer in the Delta um, to start with. And, and therefore, it's, he is using the optimization of water use efficiency as a tool to achieve this. And um, I'm, I'm just commenting because this is part of the strategy which collectively uh, we participated in. Thank um, you. That's very thank useful you. information. And uh, thank you so much. I want to move on to Dr. Abdel Hamid. One question for him related to salt affected soils. He mentioned 424 million hectare surface soil, 833 subsoil having salinity problem which probably will aggravate with climate change. One question for him. Well, it's, uh, I don't know, it it's looks like a quicker church meeting. There's nobody, no, no <laughs> questions. People are. Uh, well, um, yeah. we have made so good presentation, no questions are left. I think there'll be um, interpretation, but aerobic rice was mentioned using raised bed. Uh, I remember that uh, slide of raised bed. With this is a gindi. Yeah. Is that an option? For a large scale? No, no, he can not hear it. Yeah, it is an option now for the Egyptian agriculture that we, we are going to use a raised bed at least for the wheat. And now okay. we, we try with the rice. Yeah. Uh, there, was so a, there was a question for you, Professor Lal from Professor Sheter. He is yes. a soil science. Uh, he was a chairman of soil science department. Okay, go ahead, Professor Sheter. Yes, I, I, I think I uh, uh, thank you for good presentation you gave us concerning farming carbon. And I would like to ask you about how to keep, if there is any new methods to keep carbon in the dry areas, because as you know, most of our soils have less than 1% of carbon or organic carbon. Therefore, it is very important right now to deal with this project. So thank you. Well, that's a very good question. You are very right. Dry land uh, soils are not the best place to conserve carbon, but yet it's needed. Uh, please remember inorganic carbon, I mentioned, is a very important component. So formation of secondary carbonates and uh, formation of uh, bicarbonates and leaching them out are mechanism of inorganic carbon. Nonetheless, uh, mulch farming, uh, mulch is not only with biomass, but also gravel mulch. I was surprised nobody mentioned anything about gravel mulch in dry land. Uh, China, of course, is a great success story where they have been cultivating 300, 400 millimeter rainfall area with the successful gravel mulching. So I think that's a very good option. But some of the other technology mentioned today, certainly anything that increases the productivity of the crop, uh, trees, whatever biomass is being grown, and some of it can be returned back to the soil would certainly improve the organic carbon content. And what I was impressed with all the presentation that many practices shown did improve productivity, which is a sign to increase organic carbon content also. Thank yeah. you very much. Well, uh, thank you. Back to thank you. you. Thank you very don't, much. Don't go, uh, Professor Lal. I would like to thank you for graciously uh, giving us your keynote address as well as sharing this session. We are looking forward to see you, uh, of course, uh, any time. But specifically tomorrow, you will be chairing the session uh, for. Uh, the topic is enhancing the coping and adaptive capacity, human and physical infrastructure. This is, we are looking forward for this. Thank you very much. Uh, and Thank good you. day, sir. I will be there. Thank I you. Thank you. Back to you. I think uh, now we will ask uh, Professor Salah Saliman who is chairing, thank you, Abbasur.
uh, who is chairing the uh, the platform uh, for the African young students, as well as he's, he's an activist professor. Please, Professor Seliman. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the invitation and for uh, giving us the chance uh, to be uh, here uh, today. Uh, as a matter of fact, this morning I was uh, briefly introducing to the audience of this very important conference the program we have been uh, creating since 2011 in Alexandria, and now we have representatives in almost every corner of our uh, continents uh, made up with our graduates from this program. This program started, as I mentioned, in 2011. And uh, actually, the hope that we have, based on the fact that for a nation to develop and to stay strong, its natural resources must be wisely managed. On top of these resources, some come the people, and especially the young people, of that nation or country or whatever. Empowering the youth and considering them as real partners is a must for real sustainable development. They are the fuel and the brains in the same time and with wisdom, with them and by them, national goals can be achieved. They are the power for change and development. Just Give them a chance, and they will surprise you. And here come our program. One, two, three. Alim. Right. This is the African League of Young Master, a program we created back in 2011, as I mentioned, and with hope and aims to open channels of communication between African students bringing African students together for knowledge sharing and capacity building to foster further cooperation, promoting knowledge and interest about health, environment, and sustainable action. We always use sustainable action instead of sustainable development. Strengthen the country, country, and multi-country relation and collaboration is one of our aim from this program. I'm going to take you in just a couple of minutes through some records of our past meeting during the last few years in Alexandria and in Cairo. And some of them are meeting over there in different African countries with Alim as well. So you can see them gathering everywhere exchanging knowledge, ideas, building their own capacity, building their own knowledge and leadership capacity during the times. That's Cairo House of the Ministry of Environment where we meet every other Saturday, actually. <laughs> right, you saw one, two, three, right? Some other activities. It's only not only exchanging knowledge. This is one of the uh, workshop organized and led by Dr. Ismail Siragil Dean, I think two years ago. And this is the Alim graduation ceremonies of uh, 2020, or the, or the COVID batch, as most of them call it. This is the graduation ceremony in Alexandria in 2021. You can see the talent even of the Africans. Africa got talents, actually. There are some other activities like workshop, visiting places, training in different areas. 
This is off-class activities, by the way. It's not included in the curricula of their graduation from the universities. It's an extra curricula. It's off-class activities, as I mean. This picture is from Maghrabi Farm, where they are trained during summer. Field trips to North Coast of the Nile Delta, where we are affected much. much. Some entertainment activities as well. And this from a visit to the wind farm in Zafarana. The following speakers are from the Africa we want. So I'm inviting the fairest group of my uh, young people to represent the climate change impact and challenges on North African countries. Please welcome them. Please be seated. If the rest, the rest of you, you can sit. You can sit. They will speak in Arabic. They, these uh, are the uh, group representing North African countries: Egypt, Morocco, and Libya, Algeria, and so on. That's great. Masail khair. Barahab bikum gamian. Ana shu Ahmed, Maiyarim, wa Maiyarim, wa Yusuf. ولينا احنا بنمثل جامعه اسكندريه وجايين نتكلم عن التغير المناخي في شمال افريقيا بدايه كده مع زياده الانشطه الصناعيه والبشريه واللي بدوره ادى لزياده الكربون ديوكسيد في الجو وبالتالي الاحتباس الاحتباس الحراري او الاحترار العالمي وايضا اللي ادى لذوبان الجليد وارتفاع منسوب الانهار وبالتالي بقى عندنا زياده معدلات ظروف جويه عنيفه جدا زي الفيضانات والاعاصير وغيرهم طيب كل ده ادى لمشكله التغير المناخي اللي احنا بنعاني منها دلوقتي او اللي العالم كله بيعاني منها يعني مثلا من 1800 السلايد معلش من 1850 وقت الثوره الصناعيه كانت انبعاثات ثاني اكسيد الكربون 183.5 مليون طن 183.5 مليون طن في حين ان احنا وصلنا دلوقتي لاكثر من 35 بليون طن يعني مليار الرقم تضاعف جدا طيب احنا فعلا كده بنواجه ازمه بيئيه طب خلينا نفوكس على نقطه مهمه جدا وهي اللي احنا بنتكلم فيها اكتر النهارده وهي الفرق الكبير ما بين في الانبعاثات دي ما بين الدول يعني هنلاقي مثلا نطاق او الحيز بتاع شمال افريقيا كله بينتج لوحده 500 مليون طن في السنه بحيث ان بحيث ان الولايات المتحده لوحدها بتنتج اكتر من 4.5 بليون طن بالمليار وده طبعا فارق كبير جدا ما بين خمس دول وما بين دوله واحده طيب لو جينا نقيس انتاج الفرد الواحد هنلاقي ان مثلا في الولايات المتحده هنلاقي في الولايات المتحدة هنلاقي إنتاج الفرد بيعادل 33 مرة إنتاج الفرد في دولة زي السودان مثلا، وده فرق كبير جدا وده اللي عامل الفجوة كبيرة ما بيننا إحنا كدول أفريقيا وما بين دول العالم التانية. طبعا ده كان ليه تأثيرات كبيرة على البيئة، فاتفضلي يا نيم. Okay, as uh, pre-mentioned in the previous table that shows the emission of carbon dioxide in North African countries uh, compared to China and United States um, were negligible, which proves that North Africa is not responsible for any natural hazards happening now. And although North Africa has contributed the least to climate change, it's suffering the most. So let's now start discussing the impact of climate change on the North African region. Let's start with the, one of the most significant impacts, sea level rise and flooding. Regarding flooding, many countries in North Africa um, have, have recently experienced flood. For example, Algeria, which was exposed in 2009, 2010, and 2019. Regarding sea level rise, one of the regions that is uh, vulnerable to sea level rise is Nile Delta. 
And according to 2018 study, over 280 square miles of Nile Delta could be inundated by 2050. And this will also lead to salt water intrusion, increased salination of aquifers, and this will affect agriculture as water quality uh, for irrigation will decrease, and we will lose a lot of urban lands. Beach erosion is also one of the consequences of sea level rise, um, affecting uh, coastal, mainly coastal uh, cities as Alexandria in Egypt and Hamamat city in Tunisia, affecting uh, tourism as Hamamat city is one of uh, tourist destinations. Secondly, increase in temperature and reduce in rainfalls. In the next few years, we will witness uh, biodiversity loss and migration of species to cooler climates, and also degradation of soil quality and productivity and degrees in crops yield. And Libya, uh, would be one of the countries that would um, um, that would affect by a degrees in crop yield as if the temperature increases to two degrees Celsius it's estimated the crop yield is reduced by up to 30 percent by 2060. Moreover increase in heat stress and sandstorms affecting human health as more diseases will be spreading uh, as respiratory illness especially in children. Last but not least, increase in drought and degrees in winter affecting negatively winter uh, rain-fed agriculture. And also uh, water conflict will arise um, um, as water as it will be water scarcity result in uh, food insecurities. Uh, this uh, slide illustrates uh, the impact that we have been discussing. This uh, shows flood in Algeria in 2019 and this drought in the full region in Sudan. And this um, illustrates the predictions of uh, Nile Delta. This shows if the sea rise in 0.5 meter, and this shows if it rises in uh, one meter. And in this case, it would be essential to move about 7 million people from their homes. And it all depends on the pace of our uh, actions towards climate change. Thank you. وعشان نتجنب الكوارث المحتملة من تغير المناخ، كل دولة بتبذل أقصى جهدها إنها تقلل من انبعاثاتها وتبني مشاريع مستدامة. زي مصر اللي من أهم مشاريعها بنبان وجبل الزيت اللي بي... ومشاريع تانية غيرها اللي بينتجوا لمصر 5970 ميجا واط من الطاقة النظيفة، وبالتالي مصر بتقدر توفر 2298 طن من الكربون دايوكسيد. وفي الجزائر مزارع الطاقة في الغراضية وأضرار. اللي بينتجوا حوالي 34 ميجا واط وبالتالي الجزائر بتقدر توفر 13 طن من انبعاثاتها والمغرب اللي بتبني واحد من اكبر مشاريع الطاقه في العالم اللي هو مشروع نور 1 وبتنفذ المرحله الاولى منه بمقدار بانتاج 582 ميجا واط وده هيساعدها انها توفر 224 طن من انبعاثاتها وليبيا عندها مشروع كفرة اللي بمجرد انتهاؤه هينتج 100 ميجا واط من الطاقه النظيفه وهيساعدها توفر 38 طن من انبعاثاتها وتونس اللي قدرت تستبدل 8% من طاقتها بطاقه نظيفه ودوت بمجد... ودوت كميه حوالي 224 200 حوالي 472 ميجا واط ودوت اللي قدر يوفر لها 181 و7 من عشره طن من انبعاثاتها وهدفهم ان هم يزودوا النسبه دي ل 35% بحلول 2030 ودي بعض المشاريع في مصر في مصر زي بنبان وجبل الزيت ومشروع نور في المغرب ودي كانت بعض المشاريع اللي دول شمال افريقيا نفذتها عشان تقلل بيها من الاضرار الاضرار اللي وقع عليها من تغير المناخ اوكي نوت اونلي ذا نورث افريكان كونتريز فوكس ذير projects on mitigation projects, but they've also been working on some adaptation strategies to survive the impacts of climate change. Countries including uh, Egypt and Tunisia are now working with the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, and the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, to secure the investment for coastal defense. Uh, Morocco, moreover, is uh, focusing its efforts on preserving uh, aquifers. Uh, since groundwater represents more than 40% of the water used only in agriculture. 
Morocco has also recently signed the All Atlantic Ocean Research and Innovation Alliance Declaration, reiterating its commitment for a sustainable ocean and to ensure a healthy ocean for all communities. Moving on to the needs of the North African region, uh, coastal cities including Alexandria in Egypt and uh, Casablanca, for example, and others are threatened to flood. So coastal defense would be an essential. Um, having desalination plants in every country would also be an essential to deal with extremely dry periods. Shifting and relying more on dry farmed crops, restoring nature to absorb more carbon, saving in water consumption, using public transportation rather than private cars, and increasing the environmental education and awareness among the public. Last but not least, even though climate change affects everyone, now is the last chance for the lead industrial countries to take the lead in restoring our planet. Industrialization might have economic benefits, but what is the cost? Thank you. Next. I'm calling the West African uh, delegation, please. Lina cannot two wheel us. Okay. The honorable protocols. Professor Salah, the entire women and gentlemen, good evening. I, Muhammad Sani Ibrahim, Faculty of Medicine, Alexandria University. I'm here to present climate change impact and challenges facing Western African region with my colleague. Ajak Karomayom, representing West African uh, countries, challenges facing them. And I'm um, uh, in Faculty of Medicine, Alexander University. So, I will try to introduce our colleague, our co workers that help us to prepare this particular PowerPoint. Thank you. Next, this is the space light about the information. Latest carbon emission by West African countries compared with some other countries 2020. Just by assuming complete West Africa, they are nearly to zero, take less of China and United States. Nigeria is just emitting 125.46 million tons, 0 0.61 per capita tons. While China hormone can emit 10.67 billion tons, almost 99 times in general Africa, which is almost less than 3%. We see here uh, as well the Burkina Faso uh, emitting 3.97 uh, million tons, which uh, per capita is 1.9, which is real. We could see that Burkina Faso is not even emitting even one percent. It's less than one percent uh, compared to India and United States. And we see this. We from West Africa, we are not even contributing anything compared to, to uh, the United States and China and India, which are while the highest emitters. We do also have uh, a graph that show the world in data and as well the highest emitter, which is China, with 10.67 billion tons, compared to Nigeria, which is the highest emitter in West Africa, with 125.47 million tons. If you compare the is just below zero because above is billions and then 
below zero is millions. Thank you. So there's another illustration of another graph that shows our the world, China, United States, India, Nigeria, and Ghana, and Niger. By linear looking, you can see China is high, Niger, Ghana, and Niger, they are below. In fact of climate change of this particular region, in Nigeria, this climate change will lead to drought, lack of food, and its availability. Well, in Ghana, people from Ghana will suffer a lot, most especially change in rainfall, weather conditions, sea level rises, salinity of coastal waters, and also in Senegal, it will cause problems, most especially as their social economic development because of the rise of in their temperatures, heavy rain, rise in sea levels, and so on. Cote d'Ivoire is exposed to climate change risks, hot average temperatures, far more inconsistent rainfall and rising temperatures. And this is expected to rise by 1.2 meters in the greater Basin and Basam and Abidjan areas. By 2050 is projection, been, uh, it's interpreted that 1.4 to 1.6 rise in temperature is expected in Burkina Faso. As a result, by 2025, Benin, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Mauritania, Nigeria, and Nigeria are all expected to experience water scarcity in some countries, mainly in tropical zones. Also, this is a particular image that I want to illustrate. This is just the starting. This is a drought area in Ghana. Why this picture is just the starting that flooding that occur in Senegal. As a result, we could see that animals dying and uh, animals are sources of food and milk as well, meat and, and the rest of stuff. But you could see they're dying because they don't have water and they don't have food as well to eat. Uh, this is uh, in Mali, it was taken there in Mali. Due to climate change, you see such animal dying. And we could also expect as well that before it was like this, but now you could see the drought just because uh, there's no water. We have been affected, but we are not even contributing anything as a result. Also, the voluntary effort made by our governments to reduce the emission. They made two dams from different regions. There's Kainji Dam, which is located in Riba, Niger. That's able to produce 760 megawatt that will able to reduce the emission by 292.6 tons carbon emission. In Ghana, uh, they made also voluntary efforts in order to combat the, the challenges of climate change. And they built a dam called Akasombo Dam, which produces 1,020 megawatts. <laughs> and by this, it produces carbon emission by 392.7 tons of carbon. These countries are putting efforts, but they're not supposed to do this. These are some images of the dams. There's Kainji Dam that produces on, uh, 760 megawatt, and also there's Akosombo Dam, which is located in Ghana, that's able to produce 1,020 megawatt. As uh, Nigeria also tried their best in order to combat uh, climate change, this is afforestation, planting more trees in order to reduce uh, carbon emission. Because we know that uh, 
increase they absorb carbon and so they try to, to plant trees in order to reduce the carbon emission in Nigeria. Adaptations, because these countries also, uh, uh, they try to uh, adapt to these climate challenges and the need. Uh, and uh, as a result, there are a number of adaptation priorities for agriculture, fisheries, and water, and health sectors in Western Africa. And these include building a capacity of non-governmental organizations, NGOs, association involved in climate change adaptation, increasing public environmental education awareness. Like what we're doing now, just awareing ourselves to be able to do it. By this, the extreme events such as drought into adaptation plants. There is also a regenerative agriculture whereby lands are managed in a way that the soil absorbs and holds more carbon. We have just been talking about how we can uh, store carbon in uh, dry areas here uh, uh, recently. There is a restoration of coastal wetlands like Magroves is a natural climate solution and that restores carbon to be stored in sediment and plant areas. So also, this is a cycle that Nigeria make a national determination contribution target, the meaning of NDC. So changing private cars to bus or lorry, improving electricity, renewable energy, reforestation, and so on. Projection of climate change, if action doesn't take it. Projection of climate change in Nigeria to reveal significant changes in both rainfall and temperature. Why? As the temperature increase from 1.5 to 5.5 degrees Celsius, that will occur. So also in Ghana, as it increased by that temperature 1.0 to 3.0, 3.0 degrees Celsius, it will occur. In general, climate change from multiple codex experimental confirmation confirmed that temperature over West Africa will continue to rise by about 1.5 to 6.5 degrees Celsius. In conclusion, the world is facing a collective suicide over the climate crisis. Why? We are not the one emitting, but we are the one suffering. So, that's, we have to construct a dialogue. There's a word always we are hearing about. There's net zero, 2025, net zero, 2050, blah, blah, blah. There's need for dialogue. There are these are the words that sound great, but lead to no action. We have to make a demand to these people that are emitting most, because we are the ones suffering by flooding, drug, poverty also, livestock are dying, so they should give us a new technology and they should pay back what they have caused before. Because there is no planet B at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just would like to remind you that they are undergraduates studying in different universities in this country. Egypt, from Cairo, Alexandria, Ain Shams, Al Azhar, and several other more. And I hope that you have noticed that all the presentation given or will be presented to you, all the slides are marked with the reference from where they get the information, the numbers, and they did the calculation, the analysis, the conversion from electricity produced and carbon dioxide produced by renewable energy and carbon dioxide prevented from emission. Now I'm calling on the group of East Africa. Thank you. Uh, dear professors, 
eminent speakers, doctors, and my colleague. Good evening. Uh, in front of you, uh, postgraduate uh, students from Department of Dermatology and Andrology, Faculty of Medicine in Alexandria University, will present you to you the effects of climate change uh, in the countries of East Africa. Okay. Uh, according to latest data from our uh, from our world data record by 2020, uh, the annual carbon emission contribution by East African countries it show for total East African countries is 51 millions of tons. Uh, in indivi by individual countries, the max the highest the most was contributed by Kenya, which show. Uh, 16.15 million of tons. Uh, this is a for, uh, for annual contribution in, uh, in East African country, this is the highest most, while for the lowest uh, is from, from Djibouti, which was 0 0.35. Uh, when we compare with uh, some biggest emitters of carbon in the world, which was uh, US and China, uh, we show uh, for East African, we contribute in negligible amount of the carbon em emission. The same is also true for per capita emission. When we compare the annual emission uh, with the total population of East Africa, the same, we contribute a negligible amount compared to, to the rest, uh, to the biggest emitters of the carbon in the world. As shown in the clearly in the graph here, the China uh, and the U.S. contributed to the most uh, of the emission and the negligible contribution uh, when we compare with other countries from the East Africa. Okay, now the uh, come to the for the impacts of uh, climate change uh, in East Africa uh, due to the impact of the uh, climate change. There are, uh, ex have, we have experienced the greater temperature exceeding the global range. This has been recorded uh, maximum by Ethiopia, which was recorded 2.2 degrees Celsius higher than what have been recorded uh, in 1960. Also, uh, in the case of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, ice cap in Tanzania, there are successful uh, changes in the amount of the ice that also could uh, that also has been resulted in uh, increasing in amount of floods in Tanzania, and also there is a cases of increasing in global warming and increase uh, global warming that increase. There is also issues of global warming cause the Indian Ocean surface temperature to rise by one uh, compared to rise by one as compared by what has been recorded in 1950. Also, there is an unpredict uh, unpredictable weather condition that uh, recorded the extremities between floods and, uh, and droughts. Also, in case of health impacts uh, in climate change, there is a recorded of increase uh, in waterborne diseases and uh, vector-borne disease due to the favorable uh, environment condition for those vectors. And also recorded an uh, incident of increasing uh, strong cyclone that favor the migration of uh, breeding locusts that migrated from the desert to East African countries that also have uh, bring the major impact in crops production. Uh, this is a photos of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro ice cap that show successful changes in ice, uh, in ice cap. Also, this is a recorded uh, floods, event of floods 
that's happened at the Nile River in South Sudan. And also these are locust uh, records of a major locust epidemic. This locust was my, uh, due to migration from the desert from Middle East country to East Africa. This also due to the impact of uh, climate change. Uh, if correct measure will not be taken, the following uh, projection and the severe and worse impact might face by the uh, by the uh, by 20, 20, 100 years ahead. Uh, like a prediction uh, of incre uh, increase in temperature range that might reach to more than four degrees Celsius by 200. Also might be uh, recorded uh, on increased uh, weather unpredictability between the drought and the and floods. Also, there is uh, predicted, uh, there is predicted rise in sea water level that might range to 0 0.7 to more to two, mil, two, two meter rise that it could be, uh, replenish the smallest islands uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, I would like to welcome my colleague to continue the other part. My name is Zainab Mukinde. I'm from Tanzania and I'll take you through the, uh, the mitigation and adaptation which are done in East Africa. As we have seen that these country, this countries contribute very little in carbon dioxide emission. But not only that, these countries are facing a lot of other challenges like education, poverty, food security, and health. But despite of all of this, uh, these countries have managed to do some efforts in reducing carbon emission. As we see here, uh, there is a construction of uh, hydroelectric power in Tanzania which is expected to produce 2,115 megawatt. This will save about 826 tons of carbon emission. Also in Kenya, uh, it has launched a climate change calculator with the aim of measuring the country's carbon footprint. This will enable to track the emission from the energy sector and formulate the reduction mechanism to fast track the country's transmission to zero emission. Also in Rwanda, uh, there is a Climate Action Agenda 2030. This calls for 38% reduction of carbon emission by 2030. This project will require approximately USD 11 billion, uh, which is consisting of 5.7 billion for mitigation and $5.3 billion for adaptation. Uh, this is one of the projects in Rwanda. It is called Romagana Gigawatt in Eastern Rwanda, which will produce 8.5 megawatt to the national grid. This project will prevent about 3.3 tons of carbon dioxide from emission. Not only that, uh, there are also some adaptation projects in these countries. Uh, like in 2014, Rwanda have used USD 84.3 million in project climate smart agriculture. This will support resilient agriculture crops that will be able to adapt with the effect of climate change. Also in Tanzania, uh, they have constructed about 1.5 resilient walls uh, around the water bodies in different coastal parts of Tanzania. This could serve more than 800,000 Tanzanians that could be impacted by the rising seawater levels. Uh, this is one of the uh, pictures showing the coastal protection project in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, the, resi the resilient wall. But also these countries need other uh, adaptation projects, including uh, introduction of drought resistant crops, adaption of the sustainable water resource management. Also they need reduction of water loss through water conserving technologies and sustainable consumption. They also need to promote use of the renewable energy for domestic uses. And instead of using uh, the current inefficient wood stoves, charcoal stove and efficient lighting. They also need to promote techniques for tackling emergency food shortage. They also need to have a comprehensive, comprehensive studies and control strategies, strategies on epidemic diseases that are associated from the climate changes. 
But as we all see here, these, uh, these projects are expensive. This uh, project need, uh, need funds, they need technology and expertise, which are not readily available in this country. So it's high time for the countries who are leading with the carbon dioxide emission to cut down the uh, carbon dioxide emission as per agreement, and also help this country to build capacities, uh, to, to build capacities in adaptation projects. Thank you. Seeing they have uh, mentioned something about the uh, migrating species, and for the last actually 12 years, I've been giving a presentation about the invasive species as a pesticide chemist and pesticide man, or whatever you can call it. And I think we are facing these problems as well here in Egypt with Tuta absoluta in tomato and several other species, invasive species, because of the change of climate change. Uh, may I uh, ask our uh, group from uh, Southern, Southern Africa, please? Protocol of Dove. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Today we are here uh, to give information uh, concerning the climate change impacts and challenges facing the Southern African uh, countries, more specifically on food productions in uh, the dry areas. Uh, my name is Almago Philip. Uh, I'm a student at Alexandria University pursuing a bachelor's degree in geology and geophysics. Uh, I will be a graduate this year. On behalf of Halim, me and my colleagues today will be representing the Southern African region. Uh, this table shows uh, the Southern African carbon emission in the year 2020. As we can see, South Africa emits 451.96 uh, 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 million tons of carbon, and compared to its population, it's 7.62 uh, emission per capita. And the lowest country here being Malawi with 1.39 uh, compared to its population is 0 0.07 emissions per capita. So if you can see the regional total of this Southern African region, we can see that the total region emits 509.62 uh, million tons of carbon annually, and this was in the year 2020. Uh, compared to the population in the region, we can see the emission per capita is 2.82. Uh, the world in that year emitted 34.81 billion tons. USA, on the other hand, emitted 4.71 billion tons, and China emitted 10.67 billion tons. What does this mean? This clearly shows us that uh, the Southern African countries are emitting or they contribute very, very less to the carbon emission, yet we are the ones that are actually being affected by the climate change impact. So we call upon all of you to check this information so that we can know what to do and what is right. The chart also shows uh, the Southern African region uh, compared to China and the United States. As we can see, uh, the Southern African countries are emitting really very less compared to the giant developed economic countries. So some of the impacts that affect these Southern African countries, one includes uh, there has been cases of decline in agricultural and food production. This is mainly due to the drought and also epidemics uh, of water and vector-borne diseases has been cases in Namibia due to the extreme weathers. Also, there are cases in Zimbabwe of uh, veiled fires. And uh, for example, in 2021, a total of 400 
and 8,000 hectares of land has been destroyed because of fire. And in 2020, a total of 220,000 uh, hectares of land has been burned down. This is all because of the climate change and uh, the rise in temperature causing bushes to dry up. Uh, one of also the causes is increase in temperature and uh, change rail food patterns, which has caused agriculture to decline. For example, in Botswana, uh, no longer experiences soft rains, but rather very heavy rains. And these rains cause damages and floods to the crops. We have also uh, experienced rising sea level, which not only creates stress uh, to the physical coastline, but also there's been cases of coastal ecosystem being destroyed and uh, destruction of ports. For example, uh, Port Elizabeth has been destroyed because of uh, the rising sea levels. Uh, there has been also cases of very and most extreme hot days and nights in Angola. This is all because of unpredicted and advanced weather patterns that is also experienced in Zimbabwe. Uh, the picture on the left side showing fire is in Zimbabwe, and uh, the picture on the right upper side uh, shows uh, drought in South Africa, and down picture shows uh, dry crops or crops drying up because of uh, the climate change in Namibia. So some of the voluntary efforts the countries of the southern region undertaking to reduce the carbon emission. One, there has been an integrated approach and best practices in management of waste with a view of reducing the greenhouse gas. And this is mainly of that all done by the Botswana government. Uh, also, in northern Namibia, uh, there's been a 10 hectare solar power which produces uh, 900 or 9,000 megawatts of energy per, per year. Uh, a Shumba 30 solar project also in northeast of Botswana produces 100 uh, megawatts of uh, solar, and this will reduce 39 tons of carbon dioxide, or it will save 39 tons, uh, 39 tons of carbon dioxide. The South African's massive hydrogen valley project is also a step closer, and this project will actually uh, support in the, the reduction of emissions of carbon dioxide. A 200 megawatt uh, solar project is also expected to provide approximately 40% of the Tronex of African electricity needs, and uh, it will lower and it will save 77 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Also, installation of isolated mini grids of uh, solar panels could also reduce up to uh, 12,500 uh, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year, and this is observed in Zambia. I believe that this is the right time to inform the public that the Southern African region contribute really very less, very less carbon dioxide, but then we are the most affected by the climate change impacts. And therefore, we call upon the globe and everyone to put hands together so we can tackle and support these countries. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Carbino. Uh, I'm a student at Alexandria University, Faculty of Commerce. Uh, I could uh, take you through the effort and some of the projects that are adopted in these regions, that is South Africa. Uh, Zambia is turning to the nation to tackle the climate change, that is eco-based adaptation process. And at the same time also South Africa is making some training to national park managers and other stakeholders on the climate risk information, decision analysis, a collaborative climate impact assessment tool for water resources. And uh, this is from the, the USAID. Capacity building and training on the climate sign, vulnerability and adaptation assessment, the effective governance system for implementing the adaptation and data collection and analysis. And this is based in Angola. We also have the, developed the put for casting early warning system that is FFEW to improve the resilience within the Limpopo River, this is in uh, South Africa basin and its national member state, including South Africa. We also have the climate information training and analysis in Portuguese language and this is in Angola. 
We have also some other needed uh, adaptation. We have adaptation of strategies that will enhance the application of water and nutrition and conservation technologies and to create an enabling environment for investment in the use of renewable energy for agricultural activities and others. Prioritize climate research and feasibility study on forest conservation, restoration of ecosystem and the use of modern technology for controlling wildfire. We also have promote the use of indigenous uh, knowledge and traditional forest management practice that is contribute to the increased forest cover and land rehabilitation. And these are done locally with the local language to teach the local community on how to, to, to make good awareness on a climate change. Now with my colleague. My name is Rejoy Saduk. Uh, Alexandria University. Um, the projections in the year 2100, uh, locations around South Africa are uh, projected to experience sea level rise, and this rise is of about 0 0.5 meters above sea level, 0 0.5 meters. This increase is around 7 to 14, larger than the projections of the global uh, sea level. Then Cape Town area, is also expected to be completely flooded if temperatures increase by 30 degrees Celsius. Um, from uh, the projections, we s from the slides, we can see the picture on the left is the Cape City. It is very normal. The, the, the sea level and the land are very depreciable. So on the right, you can see that as the temperatures keep increasing, the water keep extending on land. Then uh, the picture below, we see that the water has come over to take over the whole city. So as the temperature keeps increasing, we shall see that the city will eventually flood. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm now I'm calling for Central Africa region. Rawaida Muhammad, I will be with you in the Central African region. Despite the changes of the climate, it was the greatest impact of the global warming and the global warming. And this report shows the total impact of the year in total Central African, which is 58 to 78.1 tons. مقارنة بالشينا واليونايتد ستيت فهو نسبة ضئيلة جدا لأنه بالبليون أما بالنسبة لناتج الانبعاث عن كل فرد فهو 84 من 100 مقارنة بالشينا فهو النص ومقارنة باليونايتد ستيت فهو تقريبا أقل من نص ده جراف بيوضح الزيادة في نسبة الانبعاث بتاع ثاني اكسيد الكربون من بعد سنة 1850 وده بسبب الثورة الصناعية بتساهم دول وسط افريقيا بكمية ضئيلة جدا من غازات الاحترار الا انها من اكتر الدول عرضة لاثار تغير المناخ دلوقتي هنوضح بعض التأثيرات على دول وسط افريقيا فكان عندنا في انجلا وجهة أسوأ حالة طوارئ في الثمانية وثلاثين سنة الماضية بسبب الجفاف اللي أثر على الإنتاج الزراعي وبالتالي بقى عندهم نقص في الغذاء وأطفال بتعاني من سوء التغذية زي ما حصل في تشاد وبقى عندهم انعدام أمن غذائي أما بالنسبة للكاميرون فكانت منطقة أقصى الشمال بتعاني في الزراعة بسبب هطول الأمطار وخصوبة التربة اللي أثر على إنتاج المحاصيل الزراعية وبالفعل قلت للنص ومن المتوقع إن هي هتقل بنسبة 90% بحلول عام 2100 وكانت من الدول اللي تأثرت في الصحة هي زامبيا وبسبب الفيضانات فاضطر عشرات ألاف من المواطنين إن هم يهاجروا من مواطنهم زي ما حصل في منطقة وسط أفريقيا 
وفق جمهورية الكونغو بسبب الفيضانات والجفاف مما وأثر عليهم في الطاقة والصحة وبالتالي بقى عندهم خلل في النظام البيئي وبالرغم من ان هي بتنتج نسبة ضئيلة جدا من انبعاثات ثاني اكسيد الكربون الا انها بتحاول جاهدة بمشاريع الطاقة المتجددة انها تقلل من الانبعاثات دي صورة بتوضح تآكل التربة في جمهورية الكونغو والصورة الثانية بتوضح أثر الفيضان اللي حصل في زامبيا بسبب فيضان نهر روسيدي وكانت من المشاريع اللي بتعملها أنجولا فكانت بتنتج من السولار باور 16 و 3 من 10 جيجا وات ومن الويند باور 3 و 9 من 10 جيجا وات اللي بتوفر 7 و 7 من 10 تن من انبعاثات ثاني اكسيد الكربون اما تشاد فكانت بتنتج بتخطط لمشاريع طاقة متجددة اللي هتقلل نسبة الانبعاث 217 ونص تن اما بالنسبة لجمهورية الكونغو فتركيب 113 لوح ضوئي للطاقة الشمسية وفر 13 وتسعة من عشرة تن من انبعاثات ثاني اكسيد الكربون ومن الحاجات اللي كان اللي هيتم اطلاقها في بورندي الفوتو بولتيك اما بالنسبة لزامبيا فتركيب شبكات صغيرة هيوفر الانبعاث 23 تن وتركيب شبكات صغيرة معزولة هيوفر الانبعاث 12500 تن ودي صورة بتوضح المشروع بتاع تشاد اللي هو تحت التنفيذ وهكمل معاكم مقابل ما بذل من أجل التكيف مشروع التكيف القائم على النظام الإيكولوجي في أنغولا بيساعد على درء الخطر وعلى طبيعة على استعادة النظام البيئي الموائد بيوفر دفاعات طبيعية ضد الفيضانات والمناطق الشاسعة من الأراضي الرطبة بيستفيد منه 1800 شخص في مزارعهم المشروع ده بيقوم أيضا على إنشاء نظام إنذار مبكر للتنبؤ بالمناخ تدرك حكومة تشاد الحاجة وإلحاحية وأهمية المعالجة لقضاء التكيف وهي منخرطة في اتجاه أن تصبح ناشئة الاقتصاد المستدام من خلال الرؤية التشهادية 2030 في جمهورية إفريقيا الوسطى تعمل برامج التغذية المدرسية على تحسين تغذية الأطفال والالتحاق بالمدارس في المناطق التي تواجه انعدام الأمن الغذائي بسبب تغير المناخ رواندا تعمل على خفض الانبعاثات عبر القطاعات الرئيسية للاقتصاد طورت نظاما لمؤشرات تتبع التكيف في مجالات عديدة المياه والزراعة والأراضي والغابات توطين الإنسان وصحته بعد, تبد... بعد تدابير التكيف في زامبيا تشمل تعزيز الري وكفاءة استخدام موارد المياه وتعزيز نظم الإنذار المبكر واستخدامها نظم المعلومات الجغرافية الاستشعار عن بعد في رسم خرائط المناطق المعرضة للجفاف والفيضانات ما هي احتياجات قطاع وسط أفريقيا؟ في تشاد تم حاجة إلى تكثيف الحفاظ على أصناف المحاصيل المقاومة للجفاف من خلال تبني الممارسات الزراعية الصونية للمياه وتعزيز نوع المحاصيل ترسيم خارطة دقيقة لمدى التعرض لانعدام الأمن الغذائي بسبب تغير المناخ واستكشاف السبل لتصعيد نطاق نشر آليات وتقنيات التصدي للمخاطر نحتاج لبذل الجهد لاستعادة المراعي المتدهورة وتطوير النظم الإيكولوجية في المناطق الساحلية المعرضة للخطر شكرا Now I have uh, Charles, I believe, is coming with Charles. Charles will uh, present an overview or some 
impacts on the African countries. Charles from Cairo. Hurry up. We can do this later. Good evening, everyone. My name is Charles, and uh, I'll be presenting today about the entire Africa we, compared to the rest of the world. I'm with my colleague here, Mabel Kapengele. So actually, I I'd like to thank uh, my fellow colleagues from uh, different parts of Africa who have presented from the South, uh, North, Central, the West, and the East. So actually, as I've said, I'm going to drill more on the entire Africa. I'd like to say a few words before I actually went into the, the actual presentation, because actually climate change shouldn't actually be talked about like it's a mere issue, maybe like football. No matter what happens this season, next season is going to come anyway. So it's something that we really have to take seriously because it's really affecting our everyday lives. It's really affecting people. People are really struggling out there. So actually, when it, com it comes to carbon dioxide, who, co who emits the most? Our continent, Africa, actually uh, emit the least, as most of you have highlighted, that we are the people who are suffering the most, but we are actually the ones who commit the least with uh, continents like Asia, uh, the um, the USA, Europe, and the, the rest of the world. So actually, this is just, just uh, an overview of the emission of uh, carbon dioxide for the entire world compared to our continent, Africa. So right now, I'd like to talk more about the precautions of climate change on, in Africa. Actually, climate change has affected the economy of Africa. Africa, actually, most of the parts of Africa depend on rain fed agriculture. So if there's climate change, probably even the economy of the countries are actually affected, which leads to people living to in extreme poverty. When we come with pictures here showing you how people are living in different parts of Africa, it's not just a matter of showcasing how um, taking land on pictures and making a presentation of, out of it. It's This is the real life that is happening on the ground in the entire in the most parts of Africa. In 2015, actually seven out of 10 countries which are suffering from the consequences of uh, come from the African continent, which actually shows the numbers that really Africa has suffered from the consequences of climate change in the entire world. Countries like Malawi, Mozambique, there have been a lot of floods in Mozambique recently and in the, in the, in the northern part of Africa. It's all affecting uh, our continent, Africa. Also, climate change is very critical to our health. How? With, let's say, for instance, the floods in Mozambique, it will rid a breeding ground for mosquitoes. And one of the diseases which has been affecting Africa most is malaria. This will increase, I mean, the, a, lot, a, a lot more other diseases will actually increase because of the effects of climate change on Africa. And the last not, but not the least, migration. People are actually moving out of Africa. If you see on the major channels um, on TV, people are dying, trying to flee to, to, for greener patches because they're running away from the consequences of, of climate change. So it's really, really, climate change has really affected our country so much that we really have to do something about it. It's really an opportunity that today we are standing to, in front of our professors and uh, most of you are actually uh, making, the, player, making the, the major roles in most of the leading uh, organizations and companies around Africa and around the world. Really, you really have to hear our voices as us, the youth of Africa, are speaking, as us, the, the youth of uh, Af This is just uh, some of the pictures which uh, represent the suffering which Africa is actually going through. You can see a lady who is trying to order your plant. Right, right there you can see another lady who is trying to harvest. It means, the, I mean, the production wasn't that good that year. 
right? And we can even see from, from the other picture, the, the baby, which is carried by the, the lady. It gives actually a message out there. It's not just a mere picture. This is real life. This is what is happening on the ground. So right now, I'm going to invite my friend to actually co conclude the rest of the presentation. Good evening. My name is Mabel, and I'm in the Faculty of Medicine. Um, as is already said, that Africa, being not being part of the major contributors to carbon emission, they've put in place some efforts which will help them meet climate change. For example, we have organizations like UNEP. They've worked with over seven countries into demonstrating how NDCs can be adapted and can unlock both climate benefits and socioeconomic uh, benefits simultaneously. And uh, there's also scientists who are prioritizing their research into generating new knowledge and finding optimal ways in which the land, even though affected, can be used into source of practical socioeconomic solutions. Apart from uh, big, on a, big on a organizations and uh, scientists, we also have the citizens who are also bringing forward uh, efforts to meet these climate changes. Like we have youth around Africa uh, being told to refocus their skills into finding out, into taking up actions that may help into finding impactful solutions against climate change. And there's also been encouragement of the citizens in around African countries into taking up participations in like uh, the Ghana Bamboo Initiative where they're working towards uh, finding sustainable production and consumptions. And also some students in St. Kizito High School in Uganda, they've been transforming bio waste into using it as fertilizer and recycling and plastics to be used in arts and crafts. The efforts may not be all that and used uh, into our daily lives. So there's also been adaptations in which they might be used for the people to have a better living standards or something like that. Um, for example, we have like the, the, that's been talked about in most of the conference today, they've talked about the now data, so how they're being affected by rising sea levels and salty waters. Therefore, this makes the water or in the land around the now data not very favorable for farming or for usage. So therefore, the, we have researchers and some other people who are looking for plants and fish species that may be used in such conditions. And also, uh, another example, we have Namibia, which is one of the most driest countries in the southern part of Africa. And despite being the driest country, it was also one of the first countries in Africa to have been uh, water recycled, to have water recycling plants whereby they reclaim sewage water through a 10 step process is making it able to be drinkable and used in other daily chores or households. Thank you. Next. I think after you have uh, heard from our young people from the call that they been giving in a loud sometimes voice and the message that they want to deliver to the whole world that Africa is not responsible for what is going on with regard to the climate change and its impact on the whole world. We see, we see action uh, taken by many countries now. I think in Europe, they are taking it seriously. 
after all of those incidents that they face during the last few months. The United States, the same. Unfortunately, we do not have the resources in these continents because our resources have been drained for long, very long. And we left up with almost about 1 billion, 1.3 billion people inhabiting this continent right at the moment. But by the year 2050, this number will be tripled or doubled and a half, and I think. So, uh, with the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development Goals in mind, and with the passage of years, Africa continue to grow on from the problems facing its people and push them to flee from it, to flee away. I don't think any human being can resist some, something like this, oh, I'm sorry. Like this and many, many, many other graphs and pictures. With those goals settled by the United Nations in mind and with the passage of years, Africa continued to grow from the problems facing its people and pushing them again, I'm repeating, to flee away from Africa. What we are facing or what are these people here the young people are facing from the act of others during the last 170 years. They are going to suffer much and they are already suffering, of course. All the news, TVs, radios, newspapers show from time to time how our people in our continents are suffering. We can just put a small set or list of the challenges facing our young people in our continents. Negative impact of climate change, increased water scarcity, biodiversity loss, and ecosystem loss, desertification, land degradation, reduced resilience, to natural disasters, we cannot resist them. We are not, our infrastructure is not, or have not been constructed to resist those. Potential failure to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, energy crisis, food crisis, pandemic, and health crisis, limited benefits gained from globalization. Everybody speak about the globalization during the last two or three decades. We've been promised that we are living in the one village. We are not. We cannot move even from the lines that figured out by the colonists in our continents. Every time I fly from Cairo, from Alexandria, to any country in Egypt, I look from my window in the airplane. And I couldn't see those lines separating Sudan from Egypt, or Sudan from South Sudan, or South Sudan from Kenya, or any other. Those lines were embedded in our brains and the brain of our rulers as well, unfortunately. Absence of disaster response mechanism, absence of anything actually, let us be frank. Despite the very low share in greenhouse gas, or غازات الاحترار العالمي as I call it actually, 
emission of this GHG or whatever, the continent is hardest hit by the climate change due to its slow adaptive capacity. Climate change is transforming Africa development trajectory. You can see here how much Africa is adding to the global emission. 1.33 billion ton out of those 35 billion tons emitted from others. And our young people actually explain this in details. I don't want to repeat what they have said, but these are some of the challenges I mentioned, and you can add more and more. To be successful, in preventing the impact of climate change and get ready people in countries, poor countries like all the continents, all the 54 countries in our continent, both the GEF, the Global Environmental Facility, and the Global Green Fund projects will need to enhance adaptive capacity, improve decision-making, access to markets policy, making our people have the access to other markets, policy mainstreaming, and evidence-based decision-making. This is what we need. We are not begging for support. We are asking for what we deserve. We need them, those people, those young people who are carrying guns, fighting each other, we are not making guns in, in Africa. Who is bringing those guns to us? Who? Instead of this, we need to build peace in the continent. This is just a map to show you the stolen African wealth. We need part of this to come back technology for free, and other things. Water scarcity is facing food prices. And you can you see it from the figure of the United Nations itself. Land degradation we spoke about, energy crisis, sea level rise. You can see here the delta of the Nile. You can see Alexandria in 2015 what happened. We've been using taxes hmm, as boats to move from a place to place, we have to invest in these people, the young people. Not to make Africa a dumping site for electronic waste, but bring those electronic equipment to Africa, to the young people of Africa to use. In God, we believe. In youth, we trust. Thank you. Let me uh, thank you, Professor Salah, and uh, full hearted thanks to the young people of Africa. This is, was a very nice presentation. We really thank you. Thank you all. The teamwork is showing up. You have done your effort to give us a very strong message. A message is well taken. Professor Salah tried to amplify the message, but it is already there. Thank you very much for being with us. I hope you will continue. We'll start tomorrow at 9 o'clock. I hope all of you will attend. Then we can continue the meeting until the last day. This is resilience. I hope that you will be able to do this. For all our colleagues and the eminent scientists and scholars who are with us virtually, I would like to thank you all. Thank you for being with us until late, until now, and uh, we'll be looking forward to see you tomorrow, a program uh, which we have a very intensive program. Thank you very much.
and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.